All right, perfect. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the space showcase. Um, we're going to get the ball rolling now. And so today's agenda is right now we're going through the opening remarks and meeting the panel. After that, we're going to start with the pitches. Today, we're only going to have two sessions. One is going to be focused on open topics. So that's a myriad of technologies. It's not just space. It could be AR, VR. It could be um, semiconductors. It could be uh, robotics and anything in between. Um, and then following that is going to be the space topic where we, we have selected um, eight companies to present, you know, some of the latest and greatest space technologies. So the goal of Deep Tech Showcase is to help companies commercialize, tech startups commercialize and, and get their tech to market. Because what we've seen is a lot of the times in order to get, you know, they, they always say it takes a village. It, it takes quite a few people involved joined in the effort to get a, a startup to to the level where it needs to be to commercialize to get to market to start really really offering its services so we we host these showcases in the goal of helping these startups get their tech further and, and meet the right people so the ecosystem consists of startups tech scouts and the tech scouts can be corporate or federal as well as investors um, with the goal of having the three meet each other and focusing, anchoring all of this are the events. So we have one event a month. This event is the space event. Um, the next event is going to be autonomous systems. Following that, we're having an AppWorks winners event, which should be really interesting for anyone who wants to join that. And following that is an aerospace and defense event. So there's a different theme every single month. And we try to keep it, keep it fresh and keep it relevant, especially for the dual use community. Following the showcases, we don't just wait around and, and hope that you know um, more more uh, more traction comes. What we try to do between the showcases is we try to make introductions between the the stakeholders and the startups. The goal is is to not just have have showcases, but also if an investor comes to us and says, "Hey, we're looking for um, space companies that are specifically doing proposal pr propulsion that they're looking to raise a seed round to Series A." What we want to do is we want to get those companies in front of in front of that investor because you know there's there's it's really it can be somewhat challenging to find the right companies at the right time and we really want to help ease that ease that burden and make sure that you know the people who can be connected are connected. So, as mentioned earlier, uh, the next showcase is going to be autonomous systems, followed by an AFWorks winner showcase on December eighth. Um, lastly, followed by aerospace and defense. Uh, and without further ado, I believe we're going to have uh, one of our, our sister company present a little bit on Grant. Brian, is, is your on yet? That's fine. I'm going to I'm going to run through the rest. And when Yav comes on, we are going to run through that. Okay, one initiative that we're running through the showcase is Ask Me Anything. So it, it, going in further to our vision, we are starting to host a one-on-one -on -one event. So it is going to be, the next event is going to be Matt McGregor and Max Frischman sitting down, just having a conversation about how startups can better engage with you know, the Air Force and how, and, serious questions that, that come up when engaging through the acquisitions process and how to mitigate them. So it, we, we ran one last month with the Army Applications Lab. That was a really great success. A lot of people learned things that you know, they didn't know before. So if anyone on the panel is would be interested in working with an Ask Me Anything event, we're always happy to do more of those. And we found that it's a really great value add and it helps give a guideline on you know, how to engage with Army Applications the Lab, how to engage with the Air Force, how to engage with, um, I don't know, a large corporation. It's always good to give more of a guideline and, you know, have people fishing in the right pond instead of just playing guesswork and sending out emails. It's, it's always good to know, let's say there's an online portal that can, you know, give them all the information. It's good to let them know that. So stay tuned for the Ask Me Anythings. We're going to be hosting quite a few of them and we're looking forward to having some more folks join them. Uh, the next initiative that we that we're hosting upcoming is the MOU Club. Right now, there's an AFWorks uh, solicitation that's open 
for a D2P2, a direct to phase two, which, you know, hang tight, y'all is probably going to go over that. But if you have an Air Force end user lined up, generally you're able to, to continue and to, 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 to continue on the, on the route to get more federal funding. So we help a lot of companies build a strategy around how to engage with the Air Force properly and how to find the right people at the right time in order to engage. So now introduce the, the open topic. Um, starting today is going to be Monarch. After that, we're gonna have Leo Labs presenting. After that, Aviation Aircraft, followed by Atlas Devices and Mayman Aerospace. And for space, we are going to announce them during the actual, uh, when, when we announce that panel, we're gonna give it a little time to announce the panel. So to quickly go over the open topic panel, I'm gonna call out your name. You, and you, can, uh, you can introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about uh, your firm, and then also give us a little bit of an idea of what kind of technologies you might be interested in seeing in the open topic panel. Um, and so without further ado, Brian, your, your first stop, first on the screen. There we go. Um, I'm Brian Borgery. Uh, I work with Invest Puerto Rico. Uh, as you can see, I'm in charge of innovation, investment, entrepreneurship efforts for the island. So Invest Puerto Rico is an economic development agency, um, but we work a lot with investment, new innovations, coming to Puerto Rico, leaving Puerto Rico, and, and really connecting uh, companies, new tech, particularly in aerospace, biosciences, other technical aspects, software and other things like that. So I just work a lot with those, make strategic connections, sometimes with investors, um, sometimes with other partners just to further tech and then also help the island of Puerto Rico while we do it as well. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, next up is Adam Bernetta. Adam, uh, good here. morning. Sorry about that. My phone, my phone locked up on me. Um, good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this. This is my second panel. Excited to be here. Um, areas that we're looking at uh, discussing today or, or hearing about today, orbital transfer, AI machine learning, and commercial ISR are three of the top topic uh, tech areas. And my consortium, for those that aren't familiar with it, I'm the program manager for the Space Enterprise Consortium. We are a consortium of 620 uh, small companies. Uh, well, not all small companies, about 74% are small companies and startups, and we do space-related prototyping. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Adam. Pleasure to have you. Um, next up is Corey Anderson. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Corey Anderson here. I uh, currently work at the Army ISR Task Force for the Headquarters Department of the Army G2. Ooh, Corey, I think you're Army. muted. Uh, collaborate with our agency partners, as well as, uh, you know, DARPA and other to identify remote sensing technologies. And uh, my, my primary goal here is just to learn about the varying technologies that might exist out there and what might fit into the portfolio over the long term. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Pleasure to have you. All right. Next up, we're going to have Joe McRae. Hey everyone, uh, Joe McRae here, uh, Senior Master Sergeant with the United States Air Force. Uh, I'm currently stationed in Germany at Springdale Air Base. Um, I've done a few different showcases with uh, Deep Tech and I'm also a Cyber SDTR reviewer for AFWorks. Um, I'm looking for some companies that have uh, tech that, could we, that we could apply to our operations here at the 52nd Fighter Wing. Um, I'm a computer programmer by trade, so I deal in all things comm and cyber now, but um, so cyber applications of AI training, um, all the things you guys are going to present tonight are probably interesting and can disrupt the Air Force in many different ways. And I like to make those connections. I also have some colleagues in the Space Force that I like to kind of build the bridge for as well. Thanks so much, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. Next up, Martina, you're up. Hi, guys. I am currently calling from North Dakota. I'm actually serving a Martian analog astronaut mission. 
in confinement. So the crew was really nice to give me and grant me the time to have access to this. Um, I run the, a NASA Space Ups Challenge based off NASA Glenn in Cleveland and the NASA Space Ups Challenge based in Mountain View at Ames, NASA Ames Research Center. Um, I am really helping teams to actually advance their prototypes and pitch their ideas to the market. And in um, when looking at the sector, I really want the, the gap to be bridged within hard work, as I see a lot of um, VCs not understanding hardware technologies and improvement, for example, uh, 3D printing for rockets, etc. I think that that's a gap that needs to be addressed. And um, I'm looking deeply into that. So that's my interest. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Martina. Uh, next up, we have Max Stitzer. Good afternoon, happy to join you here today. Brigadier General Max Stitzer, uh, stationed at the Pentagon here in Washington, DC. I'm a career logistician uh, practitioner in our sustainment enterprise. I've worked at uh, our depots and all the echelons on down to the flight line there. Um, I try to add value to these panels by helping be an integrator. I'm the deputy to the director of staff here on the air staff. And so I have the, the ability and, and opportunity to reach out and help connect you with any portfolio managers, uh, depending on on who you want to connect with, and uh, and then I also do this to to stay current on on what's new and all the great work and technology that uh, you all are working on out there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for being here, Max. Uh, next up, we're going to have he's not on the slide, but Andrew Uday. Hey, good day, everybody. I'm uh, Andrew Boudet. I'm a captain with the Air Force. I also work uh, at headquarters. I'm part of the Air Force Futures uh, Division uh, within the headquarters. And then uh, pretty much part of the innovative and disruptive uh, tech cell within uh, that division. Uh, just looking for new uh, creative ways at approaching uh, a problem. So really anything that really comes up to a solution that we could, you know, apply it to a potential problem or a gap that we have within uh, the uh, the military. That would be awesome. So that's uh, what we're currently looking at. So great to be here. Thank you for having me. Perfect. Thank you for being here. Uh, next up, we have Alan Cleavy. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Alan Cueve. I'm currently a logistics management specialist at Tinker Air Force Base, but I, I'm fortunate I have uh, the opportunity to work from home. Um, with As a logistics management specialist, I primarily work with as a weapon system uh, transition. And so I help weapon systems go from the organic or the uh, contract supply chain over to the organic supply chain, bringing those in. So I'm really looking for any type of new technology out there that can help facilitate this process, uh, automize some of the routine um, maintenance and uh, paperwork type of uh, actions that we have to do on a regular basis. So anything that's out there that can help uh, facilitate some of that, we're definitely interested in. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, next up, we have Stephen. Hi, I'm Steve Sokoloff. I feel a little bit... Uh, like the odd duck here. I am a, I've been a venture capitalist for about 25 years. I started as a corporate VC at Lucent Technologies doing um, a lot of uh, actually spin out technologies, doing commercialization from Bell Labs. And I spent about 15 years doing tech commercialization with um, my own fund in the US and Europe. Uh, working with both corporate labs and university labs and some defense and DOD labs. And a few years ago, decided there's enough innovation in most communities and uh, joined a partner on a New Jersey-based regional fund. So I, my investment mandate is a regional one. So I'll be interested to see where some of these today are located. And we're a generalist fund, and I tend to focus on hard technologies. Nice. Perfect. Perfect. All right. But last but not least, we have Han Ko. Han, you're up. Hello. Yes, uh, I'm up here. Thank you. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, be and also privilege to be here with uh, uh, Deep Tech. Um, 
you guys are rock, in other words, okay? It's their premium program, the value they bring to the community, that's to the, to the community uh, uh, startups. I always uh, admire, respect that. Uh, again, like I said, I'm, my name is Han Ko. Uh, I'm a president and CEO of uh, USACO Group. We are an international investment company. We um, are in the space of uh, multiple industries, from, from uh, the space tech to uh, robotics to AI, multiple. I personally have a PhD in uh, computer science, electrical engineering. So I have an engineering background and I actually started up uh, my own company about a few decades ago and then learned how to exit and all that. So I'm just turning that experience into a venture capitalist right now. So we have an office, we are based out of USA, but we have an office in Seoul, South Korea. We actually maintain two offices there. So we do a lot of work in Asia as well, along with Europe and Israel. So thanks so much. I'm looking forward to working with you closer. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Han. All right. And now we're going to go back a little bit in time and we're going to have Joe present our sister company, Eagle Point Funding. Joe, you're, you're up. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure being here. I don't want to take too much time and I want to let the awesome companies presenting uh, do their work. Um, I don't want to take too much time. I'm Yoav Joe Sadan. I'm the business director of Eagle Point Funding. We're the separate division here at Deep Tech Showcase. Uh, and our job is essentially to help a lot of companies in the showcase to apply for non dilutive R&D funding, which is essentially saying if federal agencies in the DOD, outside DOD, um, have projects and they're looking for companies to apply, we're the ones who can help you expedite the process and do the formatting. Next slide, please. And it's extremely present right now because we're the missing link. And at the moment when there's uncertainty, where is additional funding going to come from? The R&D funding can go and supplement it. It's good because it can show VCs that you've been vetted by a federal agency good because it can help in the client discovery within the federal aspect and it can help a company grow um, again i don't wanna i want to be respectful of time next slide essentially what we do is we'll team up with a company and we want to help them raise 750 to a million and a half dollars in the first 18 months of working with us and up to 30 million dollars during a, kind of a multi-year relationship we'll team up with a company understand where the tech is trying to go and um, then go and submit continuously. Over the first nine months, 50 to 60% of our companies win at least one award, and all of our companies win anywhere from 450000 to $4 million plus in the first 18 months. Um, that's that. We're, we're pretty selective with the companies. That's why I'm super proud and happy being a part of the showcase. Um, and if you're interested in meeting with me or talking with us, seeing what we can do, there's a fancy QR code that's here on the right. You can take out your phones and scan it. Or I'm available at YOAV at EaglePointFunding.com. And uh, last but not least, we also have a space. Ask me anything that's happening next week that I'll put in the chat. So we're here to be supplementing. We're here to help the companies get more R&D funding and get um, their projects also funded by some federal agencies. We'd love to help. Um, that's it. I already monopolized way too much time. Um, looking to see some awesome companies and I see some familiar faces here. So let's have a great event. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Joe. Um, and last but not least, there's there's one one more panelist who I did not get the chance to introduce. We have Bob Christopher um, from Diamond Edge Ventures. Bob, if you want to quickly introduce yourself. Sure. Hi. <clears throat> um, nice to be right here. I'm a I'm with Mitsubishi Chemical. I'm in the venture capital side of the company. Um, been here for almost four years, actually over four years. We focus on a lot of uh, deep tech areas for our company. Uh, we focus on 5G, millimeter wave communication, a number of material science um, challenges that are being presented in deep tech and, and satellite systems. So we work heavily in those areas. Um, so I'm looking for innovation in that in those capacities. Uh, before this, I was a director of innovation at Panasonic. So I did some um, work as well in the satellite space there. So nice to meet everybody at the on the panel. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Bob. All right. So without further ado, I think we're good to get started. And the first company that's going to be presenting in the open topic is going to be Monarch. Um, Either uh, Connor or Joe, I just allowed 
sharing. Um, whenever you're ready, go right ahead. Thanks, Asher. We'll pull up our presentation right now, but thanks for having us. My name is Joe Kafari. I'm the CEO here at Monarch. Um, and today we're going to talk about dark matter, which is our material sciences business. Um, we're solving an interesting problem. Can you flip up the presentation on it? Um, we're solving an interesting problem here in terms of what's happened for the last, since 1975, our studies have been done about how to use armor to prevent the penetrating event that's causes lethality in the, in the field. And what we've done is studied this to the point where we've realized and created a product that takes advantage of armor's capability of pre preventing that you know, penetrating event from occurring in field to now we actually disperse the energy behind it. So not only do we solve today's problem of a non-penetrating event, but we also solve tomorrow's problem of getting you back in the fight. Um, our pads have been um, developed over the last year. These are sold throughout multiple channels for the military, law enforcement. They're run throughout the world. Um, it's not just about ballistic trauma. It's about blunt force. It's about vehicle collisions that happen on an everyday basis. Our first product was our energy dispersal pad. We studied this extensively to find out how much energy we we're actually able to disperse in the case of an individual ballistic round coming into it. And it was substantial. So we designed this to be a universal fit across all the kits that were out there today and being run around the world. So not only on a hard armor basis, but also on a soft armor basis, because it's more prevalent in law enforcement. And now we've evolved into both a bonded product, taking our product and actually adhering it directly to the back of the armor. So it's a singular skew, which makes everyone in the military and the government so much happier to actually creating a suit out of it that actually uses our protective pad, both in the front and the back, but also fragmentation protection across your upper torso, under your arms, shoulder pads. So this is now a true undergarment of under armor. So we've been in business for a little over a year. Uh, we've been in revenue since the beginning of this year. We have 12 full-time employees, six consulting firms that help us across all the different facets that we sell to today. We've received the gold rating from NTOA. Um, we're now in the second phase of creating actually new levels of testing even beyond NIJ ratings. So how big is this market? This seems like it's something that should have been done before and it hasn't because people were always focused on if it passes NIJ rating, fantastic. If it passes the 44 millimeter test, fantastic. But what was happening and similar to what happened with CTE is that Armour was solving today's problem that was a penetrating event, but causing and looking at tomorrow's problem, six months of problem, and that was the energy that was going into the body. So this is a large market, $6 billion today. We're going after a huge chunk of it. We manufacture all this through our veteran-owned small business here in Rochester, New York. Um, we distribute these through multiple channels. First market we went after were first responders. Then we started going into the special forces, and now we're going across the service branches. So our partners are pretty recognizable names. Um, across both the US domestically, Granger's our largest partner, but we also partner with the different parts of the government as well so that we can continue to evolve the product to meet the needs of today's warfighter. So what do we look like against our competitors? Is we looked at what the market was and other products were going and using different levels of foam. And that just, it passes the test, which is fantastic, but it doesn't disperse energy. Our whole focus is keeping that warfighter in the fight so they can fight again. Keeping that law enforcement, getting them back in the, the, the saddle the next day so that they're able to prevent those physical injuries as well as the psychological ones that come with it. So our first product, we're very sensitive to material sciences and the trauma pads. Then we've gone into load bearing systems because if you've ever had a 75 pound rucksack on, you want that to feel lighter. We use the same material science and the straps to do that. Then we went into insoles because one of the biggest injuries coming out of the, the military were both foot and hip and knee injuries and lower back for that matter. Our insoles use the same technology now to make your feet more comfortable, make your day better on the, out in the field. And we're using the exact same technology now going into sporting goods, Little League Baseball, hockey, soccer, um, rugby, cricket, you name it, depending on the country that we're in. So we're looking at 106 million over the next few years, five-year cumulative of over 266 and 38 million in EBITDA. 
management team's been around a while. The average tenure is over 20 years with folks that have very deep military experience, um, both out of West Point as well as distrib distributors out of Granger. So we've tried to build an organization that really is covering the gamut for the different channels that we're going into. We also, if you're working with any of these types of entities, you need to have people that are inside the entity. So we have special forces individuals, we have Homeland Security individuals, both in the US and internationally. We just opened up in the UK. We now have two distributors there working with entities from the MOD to the SAS. And we also brought on an individual most recently who comes from a, a long career with Nike, DuPont, and other advanced fiber companies. What are we doing? We're doing a 7 million preferred equity round at a 30 million valuation. We're trying to grow this company as fast as possible because we want the impact that we can have on today's warfighter needs to be today, but also into the future. As you see that torso suit, that torso suit was originally designed for the warfighter on the ground. We're now taking it underwater and putting it inside scuba suits. We're then taking it above the ground because we've had people come to us and say, what can the impact on this be in a flight suit? 30 seconds. What are we looking for? Fantastic. We're looking for MOUs, more letters of support so that we can continue to drive this technology further into the different branches of the military. We're closing our Series A in the next 45 days. We're launching our hybrid bonded product at the SHOT Show in Vegas in January. And we're in the process of developing prototypes on that full kinetic energy dispersing suit. And that suit also has heating and cooling. So our friends in Alaska, as well as our friends that are in extreme temperatures like Afghanistan that are running from 40 to 134 in the same day, we wanna keep those people both hot and cold. We create temperature stasis. So again, we solve a problem that armor does a great job of pre preventing that, that penetrating event, but not the after effect. And that's what we handle. The same thing that CTE sees today, we're gonna to see the exact same things with these types of injuries. Thank you very much. Perfect, awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. All right, just so everyone knows how it works in terms of the Q&A is that panelists can virtually raise their hand and we'll, we'll have the questions go in order of hands raised. Also, I'd like to ask everyone to please turn on their video if they are able to. Um, all right, without further ado, Hanke, you're up first. All righty. Well, great technology and great presentation. Uh, very impressive. Just got a quick uh, question here. Actually, two questions. So first of all, do you have any restriction on uh, working with the uh, uh, overseas entities such as, uh, you know, ally government or uh, companies? You mentioned that defense technology, but also mentioned in automobile. So I'm kind of interested in that. That's one yes. question. Second question is that uh, you said I'm going to be at uh, January CES. Uh, you, said, you said I'm going to be at show. And, I'm sorry. This, it's called Shot Show. It's the week after oh, CES. Oh, week after. Okay, well, I'll probably be there, so I might even uh, meet up there too. Anyway, that's the two of my questions. Thank. You. Yeah. So to answer your first question about the um, overseas markets, we're a non-ITAR restricted product for the military, so we don't have any restrictions from that perspective. And we've had a lot of interest in the overseas markets for sporting goods as well as automobiles. So we're open to those conversations <laughs> as well. Awesome. Awesome. Perfect. And then Martina, you're up. That was an incredible presentation. I am so excited because I fall under material engineering. That's my background. Um, can you please tell me uh, what's the latest uh, material that you've uh, been able to incorporate or develop in your R&D, if that's something you can disclose? And um, what would be your first space testing if you can opt for one? How would you actually immerse this into the space sector with testing? Yeah, so to answer your first question about the materials that we use, um, I, can, I can't go into the details on it. Obviously, we have file patents around this. We have IP protection. But from a materials perspective, the way that we filed our patents gives us flexibility of the individual substrates we use inside nylon. If you look at our product, you're going to go, yeah, Joe, that's obviously not nylon. So can't hide that one. Um, the suit will be a very similar outside structure in terms of that material. But then we integrate Kevlar and other weaves into different parts of the suit so that it's stab proof. Um, and other protection, one of the injuries we're seeing most coming back from the Ukraine right now is fragmentation injuries across the upper torso, which we prevent with this suit as well. Um, we can't go too much deeper than that on the material science side, but we're happy to have a conversation under NDA and dig a little more deeper into it. The first application we'd love to see in space is that 
we've seen that using this types of materials uh, tightly across your body is able to prevent some of the um, G-force that you're seeing at um, lower levels. We have obviously not tested at higher levels, but from a mathematical perspective, if we correlate what that pressure is on the individual pilot, we think it has a lot of potential into the future. I would include radiation on that notch, um, just so it adds more value. So maybe if you can incorporate that in the future, that would be great if, if not incorporated already. Absolutely. Yep. Totally agree. Talking the same language. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Martina. Okay. Steven, you're up. Um, I think this is uh, really interesting and I like the big picture. And if you heard my introduction earlier, you're in region for me. So I just love to ask right now um, about your 22 revenues and your gross margin, just to understand the economics of your business. Yeah, so we're targeting just under $10 million for 22 and around 26 for 23. Um, gross margins are very healthy um, in excess. Yeah, of they're in the uh, mid to high 40s. Um, so basically, you know, we MSRP it for around 80 for a single unit. We make it for less than 30. Uh, our net right now is about 18%, um, but the gross are in the mid 40s. We continue to drive that that cost of goods down uh, from a manufacturing standpoint, especially with scale. And as we go into new products outside the military, the margins just get larger. Very interesting. Thank you. Perfect. Andrew, last question. Yeah. So great stuff, guys. Love it. Um, I had a question, I guess, with regards to um, alternative applications. Um, and then more specifically, kind of going with the the after theme of, of space. Um, have you guys looked into potential like uh, vacuum testing and maybe putting it on like a CubeSat or, or any of those aspects to see how well it performs, how well it dissipates heat, stuff like that? Yeah, so we, we have a very high heat dissipation rate, um, especially against other technologies that are currently out there. Um, I can tell you that we've looked at alternate applications that apply to below water vehicles as well as above air vehicles um, because we have a very high anti-vibratory signature, which is important not just in space for the actual shell itself, but also for um, some interesting ISR things that we can do with it as well. Perfect. Awesome. I'm sorry, Alan. We that's all the time we have for this one. Oh, but no if, you, if you want to ask the question in the chat, um, feel free. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Monarch. Uh, that was fantastic. Next up, we have Vic Gardner thank from Neo Labs. Presenting Vic, feel free to share your screen when you're ready. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> so my name is Vic, and I'm the president of our Leo Labs Federal subsidiary. We uh, Leo Labs is a post Series B uh, startup. So we've raised uh, nearly a hundred million dollars. Um, we're a space domain awareness software as a service products company, and so we operate a global network of radars. Um, right now we have five operational sites, uh, eight radars, and those, those sites are in uh, Alaska, Texas, Portugal, Costa Rica, and New Zealand. Um, so I'm in, I lead our, our federal subsidiary, so this is um, focused on sales and service to the U.S. government. Um, and I uh, wanted to briefly show a, a overview of our, our product portfolio. So um, primarily in the defense market, we're uh, parlaying our success in the commercial market, primarily around collision avoidance and space traffic management to use our same technology uh, for space domain awareness. And so that includes um, sending indications and warnings to, to high value assets or defense operators, as well as uh, tracking, tracking threats, uh, such as non-cooperative launches out of China, Russia, others. Um, in addition to some of the anti-satellite testing they may have on orbit already. So the first, uh, first, first product there is 
um, tracking these patterns of life and change detection from some of the on orbit threats. Um, these high interest objects are, are tracked up to 10 times a day by our radar network. Um, these are phased array radars. Um, so they're electronically ste steered. Uh, we, we can very quickly move from object to object. And so um, in addition to the actual hardware being uh, quite robust and scalable, our products are also operated in the Amazon Web Services cloud. So all of our orbit determination, collision avoidance, maneuver detection um, is, is happening in AWS. Um, so this, this creates a, a really low latency for um, information, you know, from the time of detection uh, when a satellite flies over a radar to um, information and intelligence being transmitted to our defense customers. Uh, the second product I wanted to highlight is a neighborhood watch uh, with indications and warnings of some of this threat activity for our high value asset operators, um, both within the US government and allied governments. So on the left side of the screen, you see some of our rendezvous and proximity oper operation monitoring and visualization so that our Space Force guardians and other uh, analysts can uh, understand the battle space um, understand how uh, threats may be uh, approaching or even observing uh, some of the U.S. and allied satellites. Um, on the right side, we have a few um, few other screenshots from the same product uh, where we're monitoring orbital planes in, in a sort of neighborhood watch um, of our user and customer high value assets. Okay, and finally, um, we are using uh, the same technology to do non-cooperative launch tracking. So our phased array radars take very precise range and Doppler measurements. We also have secondary arrays on each of these ground-based radars um, to allow for interferometry to, to calculate very um, uh, highly accurate azimuth and elevation measurements. Those four measurements translate into very low covariances of um, of each of these newly launched threat objects. Uh, the Doppler measurements also allow us to um, count individual payloads. And then finally, we have some artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques that allow us to characterize each, each object as its launch. As its launch. So we think this is gonna be very beneficial in a future state when uh, state uh, governments like China are launching their own version of Starlink um, or, or some commercial satellites. And many satellites are coming off a launch vehicle at once. And, and we, the US or, or allied governments need to quickly uh, characterize, yes, these are those, those 60 commsets or, um, hey, what's this extra payload? Um, maybe a threat uh, hiding among them. So um, those are some of our core products in the defense market. Um, I also wanted to make an a, a couple asks. One is, um, you know, if 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 you or or one of your colleagues would be a, a user or a buyer, um, I'd love an introduction. Um, finally, uh, my organization is also chartered into going into some of the adjacent markets like missile defense, and so we do. We were selected in the last uh, phase two cyber round uh, with some uh, UHF. 2D UHF tracking technology uh, for um, tracking hypersonics and missile defense uh, that was selected but not funded. So if, if anyone has um, you know, the right POC, maybe at the Missile Defense Agency or the Space Force um, to investigate uh, funding that proposal that was selected, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Awesome, thank you so much, Vic. All right. Han with the quick draw hand, followed by Adam. Han, go right ahead. Right, quick draw. Thank you. Hey, um, great uh, technology there. Appreciate it. Um, have you talked to? I'm just trying to uh, uh, go with the last uh, comment you made. Have you uh, worked with the NGA, National Geospace Agency? Uh, any way, well, chance? We have not yet. The um, you know, to date, we've mostly worked with some of the satellite operators. In that case, the the NRO being the satellite operator for the NGA. So, no, I, I have not talked to the NGA. Don't have a whole lot of context there. 
Oh, okay, well, I'll maybe be able to help you out on that one. Uh, so okay. let's have a chat offline later. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Han. Perfect. Adam, you're up. Hey, Victor. Um, quick question on the uh, non cooperative launch tracking and that AI ML machine system that you guys were using to characterize objects that were launched by potential adversaries. How much uh, development have you seen with that? And have you gotten that in front of anybody, maybe inside of uh, missile track, missile warning organizations inside of Space Systems Command yet? Um, to date, we have gotten it in front of uh, Delta Two, and so we're we're gonna hope to propose that um, as a direct to phase two cyber in this call that just came out. Um, uh, to answer your question, yeah, we've we've spent um, a couple months of our own internal development, so we have a little bit of prior art there, which is why I, I, I'd like to go to a direct to a phase two. And um, yeah, uh, primary plan is. Uh, hopefully to look for an MOU from Delta II within the Space Operations Command. Perfect. Um, we might want to sync up a little bit after this. I'll shoot you my information on LinkedIn or something like that, and we'll connect. That's great. Thanks so much. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. Next up is Steve Testa. Steve, you're up. Yes. Hello. Uh, Steve Testa, SSC, SCBC, uh, Industry Outreach and CRADA Development. Um, don't know if you've submitted your information into the SSC front door yet. Um, I encourage you to take a look at uh, the SSC webpage and the front door webpage and consider um, submitting into that uh, in the near future. Over. Okay, thanks. I, um, uh, I believe we have. We wrote a white paper to meet with the space domain awareness team um, in Maui last month, but I'll uh, double check that you know it, it it did indeed get submitted. Appreciate uh, we'll it. Roger that. We'll roger that. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. All right. If anyone else has any questions for Vic, feel free to hit him up in the chat. Um, thank you so much, Vic. That was fantastic. Uh, next up presenting will be one second everyone bear with me greg with aviation aircraft greg uh feel free to share your screen when you're ready to go excellent thank you very much let's get this going all right hello everybody so a slightly different uh different more terrestrial pace here than the last couple which have been fascinating um, just might make sure that we can see the presentation here. Um, perfect. My name is Gregory Davis. I'm the president and CEO of Eviation. Uh, we're the maker of the world's first all-electric commuter aircraft. And let's test out the bandwidth with this. I've kept this short. So that was a very short version of the uh, first flight of the world's first all-electric commuter aircraft. We've, we've flown a uh, full-scale uh, proof-of-technology uh, prototype aircraft. Uh, it was just over one month ago, um, making us the, the first in the world to do that. Uh, what was important about this aircraft, it demonstrates uh, full, fully electric propulsion, so energy storage system, the aircraft battery, they, working with the electric propulsion units, uh, and it's also the world's first uh, Part 23 or commuter-sized uh, fly-by-wire aircraft. Uh, so, th the reason why we're doing this is is that uh, aviation uh, is set to become anywhere between 25 and 50 percent of global CO2 emissions by 2050, by the industry's own reckoning. Um, aircraft, uh, of course, uh, are, are noisy. They tend to tend to produce noise. A lot of that is turbine noise and also propeller noise. And uh, we've seen the cost of flying increase, right? Despite our best efforts, it's actually continuing to go up. Um, a lot of that is because of, of things like the cost of aviation fuel, uh, which is subject to market conditions, and also things like pilots uh, and maintenance technicians. And then we haven't seen any real evolution, like a real re revolutionary technology come into the aircraft industry in decades. So what we're doing about it is we've produced an all-electric aircraft. So it, it's li literally spe zero, zero specific emissions, meaning there's nothing that comes out of the plane when it flies. 
it's optimized for uh, for for low noise. So low uh, low noise will allow it to penetrate into airports with uh, with curfews and other restrictions. The uh, aircraft itself, uh, of course, run on electricity, which is you know one tenth the cost per kilowatt hour versus uh, the equivalent power derived from from today's jet fuel and electric propulsion technology. So the, the change in the way that we propel aircraft, this is the biggest change since we went from the Super Constellation to the 707, the piston engine to the jet engine, uh, and that was in the 1950s. So this is what we're here, and this is what we're doing. Um, the electric technology, it, it, it actually converges on short-range air travel. And what's important to know is that globally, more than 50% of all flights flown are less than 500 nautical miles. And more specifically, in, in our target range, uh, somewhere between 20 and 30% of flights are 250 nautical miles or less. Uh, that, that's geographically dependent, so between 20 and 30%. And when you look at the market that services these aircraft, uh, there's 50,000 general aviation aircraft that fly these routes. And when you look at where our, our plane, where Alice is going to come into play, uh, it, there's about two to 4,000 uh, aircraft currently operating. But what we're going to do is we're going to change the economics of these aircraft, and we actually foresee us being able to scale that market again. We're, uh, we're leading the pack right now. Um, we get to hear this from our customers, from our suppliers, uh, and from our regulators uh, in terms of the integration of the battery technology, the propulsion, and the airframe. Um, and we're the only company that uh, that's flown a, a full-size aircraft. Uh, in terms of maintenance cost, so one of the, the reasons why we're going to make this, this work is, of course, it's affordable to operate. So there's the energy cost for flying it, but then there's maintaining it. Uh, there's no, there's only one moving part in an electric motor. Uh, turbines are, are actually one of the most expensive things to maintain on an aircraft, and we completely change that with this technology. We acknowledge the fact that there is CO2 generated uh, when electricity is generated. So, you, you know, we like to say you're only as clean as the grid. But using the current mix of energy generation for the, the powering of the aircraft and also for the fabrication of the aircraft, compared to the next best comparable aircraft in the sector, will produce, you know, 25% of the carbon either on a seat mile basis or a lifetime basis, however you want to look at it. Initially, we're going to enter into service with a 250 nautical mile range. Uh, so depending on where you are right now, if you think about a, uh, a, a, the, the ne next nearest airport to where you are and, uh, and also something 250 nautical miles away, these short range routes are actually where the electric technology converges. So typically with a turbine aircraft, you get more efficient as you fly higher and cruise longer. It's actually the opposite with an electric airplane. Um, it's, it's optimum efficiency is, is close to sea level, and uh, it actually converges very well to short range routes uh, in terms of, of how the, the aircraft and battery integrate. Um, so, you know, I'm here in, in, in Seattle, Washington right now, and uh, there, there are, are dozens of airport pairs that, uh, that we could service from this one location, and we could play a game later where you could name where you are, and I could tell you where you could fly. In terms of where we're at, so again, we're first to market. We currently lead the industry in battery technology. Um, we've optimized our design to purposely make our product beautiful and appealing. We, we want to make sure that people feel joy when they fly. We're bringing together all of the best technology from the, the major tier one industry players like GKN, Honeywell, and Parker uh, for things like the air flight control systems, uh, of, of course, the avionics and structures that we're going to have. And then we've been at the forefront of regulatory engagement, which is why we feel confident that we're on a path for first, uh, first to certify. Three revenue generators, obviously we're aircraft manufacturers, so aircraft sales, the uh, supporting uh, ground equipment, which includes the charging network and services. And then uh, for any aircraft manufacturer, of course, there's the aftermarket, which is the uh, series of, of profits that will come uh, as we support the aircraft and service, uh, a revenue stream that simply grows as we get more, airplane in, uh, more airplanes into service. 30 second warning. We have firm aircraft uh, orders right now. We've got, uh, uh, well, actually, as of today, there's over 200 orders, uh, some of which have yet to be announced. And uh, we've convened a panel of uh, industry experts to, uh, to help lead us through here. So there you go. Thanks for that, Asher. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Greg. All right, Han first, and then after that, Bob. Right. Uh, Greg, actually, great technology. Actually, I read about your um, 
uh, achievement to not too long ago. I think you had a first flight in September, right? Or something? September, that's right, September Yeah, yeah about a month ago. I, I remember that actually, because I'm interested in uh, this the carbon net zero space uh, in vehicles. So I read about it. It was an honor to actually see your presentation here. I didn't expect that. Today. Anyway, um, uh, could you tell me about your uh, uh, range? I mean, I guess, uh, you know, it's a lot to do with the battery limitation, right? So could you tell me about the range of the um, the distance they can handle and then uh, uh, what uh, funding side you're looking for, you know, things like that? So. Okay, so the aircraft range, it's the number one question we get. Going back to that statistic about how these aircraft operate, currently the aircraft operate, the aircraft in this size, nine passenger range, they, they fly for one to two hours typically. So that's, that's actually what we will be able to achieve. That's uh, 150 to 250 nautical miles, what we call day VFR range. We will be able to do that entry at entry into service, and then it will increase uh, with battery technology to a point. But we're not going to perpetually increase the range because people don't use their aircraft that way. Cape Air, which uh, has ordered 75 aircraft, they operate uh, out of Hyannis, New Jersey. Um, they could operate 80% of their routes with the uh, range that we're able to operate on, uh, offer on day one. So I think one to two hour flights, 150 to 250 nautical miles, that represents the bulk of the usage case. And we're in Series B fundraising right now. Uh, total raise that we're looking for is 200 million. That will get us through the critical design review phase or, or the point where the aircraft is actually designed. Got it. Actually, one uh, just question tag along the first one. As uh, about, I guess about 10 years, about 10, 12 years ago, Airbus was trying to make a hybrid, right? So uh, I'm just uh, uh, you know, thinking about your competition possible in the future. Yeah, so there, there's something like 400 companies that have sprung up in the electric uh, and hybrid aviation space right now. We haven't seen anything like this in aviation really since the beginning of aviation. Um, in so one fun fact is that electrical technology, uh, if purely electric aircraft is actually less technologically complex than building a hybrid aircraft, uh, because you simply have to integrate the one power source into the system. That's one of the reasons why we really anchored on that technology. There are several other players, lots of eVTOLs out there. We're excited about it. You know, ultimately we're a business, but we're also uh, sustainable aviation advocates. So lots, lots in the space. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Bob, you're up. Nice to meet you, Gregory. It's a great presentation and I'm really interested in, in your um, overall approach. And I'm curious now just to look under the hood and see what you have. Um, I'm, I'm actually interested in, in um, what materials are using to lightweight your plane. I'm imagining probably using aluminum now, but I, we, uh, we're we obviously very big and we are companies big in carbon fiber and composites. So we do a lot of lightweighting for uh, other uh, VTOL um, companies and um, worked a lot with Kitty Hawk, um, helped them a lot with their lightweighting, but apparently they've now gone out of business. And I'm kind of on that note, I'm just curious on a business level, how do you see their, I guess, failure to succeed and how would that affect your plans in the future? Because they were doing passenger, um, <clears throat> basically an air taxi, and I think it was in New Zealand. They had their operations set up there, but um, uh, just interested to hear your your thoughts just about their overall, uh, if you will, lack of success in the market. So, so for, first off, right out of the bat, the aircraft's uh, carbon fiber. So it is. Uh, it's, we're, we're we're right there with you on that. Uh, with respect to the market, so not to speak of anyone specifically. I think you're going to see consolidation in the VTOL sector. I mean, a lot of these companies have already done their public offerings. They've SPAC'd and, and they've raised capital, but it's going to be difficult to raise subsequent capital, though, though some are continuing to do so at a fairly impressive rate. Um, I think what you've seen with uh, with Kitty Hawk is, is really just a just a consolidation. I mean, they're already linked in with other developments. Uh, there's a lot of brain power there that's, uh, I think, being redeployed. Uh, that's that's my, my two cents. But with respect to the market and eVTOL versus eCTOL, We've, we've specifically chosen a conventional takeoff and landing aircraft so that we can enter in using existing infrastructure, existing airspace, existing airports. Um, I, like, I heard this well described by, by Kevin Michael, who's an aerospace uh, uh, analyst, um, runs aerodynamic consulting. But he, he said that you look at this sector and there's really sort of a four square. You've got piloted and unpiloted passenger and cargo, right? whether it's CTOL or VTOL. And when you think about market acceptance and, and also regulatory acceptance, it's you can get your head around unpiloted cargo, you can get your head around piloted cargo. 
you can get your head around piloted passenger, but it's difficult to get your head around uh, unpiloted passenger. And so broadly speaking, I would say looking at the eVTOL sector, that's we're, 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 we're paying attention to it. Um, and, and we are conscious about the decisions we've made with our product. So I'm really impressed that you have fly-by-wire um, technology in place. That's a, that's an area that I worked on a lot with, what I say drive-by-wire, break-by-wire at uh, Panasonic. So uh, that's a, impressive feat by itself and this last question um are you going to be um using ai to optimize any of your systems um as you learn and get more flight data through all your passenger flights yeah that's yeah so certainly we're we're looking at at all applications of technologies i mean building an electric airplane it's a it's you call it a war on weight uh, as, as is building any airplane but we really have to optimize everything it's one of the reasons why we're doing this um, so yeah, we'll, 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 we'll look at various uh, learning. So, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Got it. Hey, thank you. Very impressive. All right, perfect. Next up is Brian. Um, yeah, so you had mentioned your battery technology. I was curious if you could share a little bit more on that, particularly is it battery technology that you've that's totally proprietary to you or how you have it built out? And if so, is there other applications beyond just the planes that seem readily available? Yeah, that's a great question. So just to go first to the proprietary nature, we're an aircraft manufacturer. So what we specialize in is integrating systems together. So we're, we're, we are fully in charge of the intellectual property, fully in command of the intellectual property for making the battery system work for an aircraft and to be certifiable. That's ours. Uh, we've worked with industry experts. We've actually worked with an automotive powertrain company called AVL to build the, uh, to actually build out the cassettes. And there's different layers of logic that go into making a, a, a battery system certifiable. One thing I like to point out is that when you're a fully electric airplane, your battery system is actually also part of your flight control system. Okay, so there's there's some really interesting integrations that are more than just powering the plane from a from a propulsive perspective. So yeah, so that's ours. Uh, in terms of the technology and applicability, um, the uh, the batteries themselves are of course very high efficiency, but you can't have typical degradation of a battery uh, in an aircraft. So they're they're going to be replaceable items, not 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 line replaceable, but they will be things that get replaced as part of the routine maintenance for the aircraft. And we are developing a secondary ecosystem because those re removed battery packs from the aircraft are probably still gonna be better than most commercially available battery packs. So we're looking at redeploying them, for instance, in our charging network and, and some other applications as well. So that's that's ours, yeah. Okay, thank you. Awesome, last question, Corey Anderson. Uh, Corey? Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, great briefing. I've been tracking the technology along the way. And like you said, the uh, the the battery replacement cycles, um, you know, some days you're going to get 35 minutes of flight. The next day you're going to get 25 minutes. Of flight. How do you monitor battery health so that you always know that you're within the FAA's rules for 30 minutes of uh, reserve and such like that? Yeah, so state of health monitoring is part of the the system that we've developed. It, it functions already on the aircraft uh, in the prototype phase, so we've we've got that. And and yeah, I mean batteries batteries are a little bit more fickle than aviation fuel. Um, when you put in a gallon of ga of gas or gallon of of jet fuel, it produces the same amount of energy every time. Um, batteries charge at different temperatures; they need to be held at, at, in a constant state and monitored. And so this is the technology that we're actually bringing forward from the ESS or the energy storage system uh, perspective. So, so what, what we're doing is with respect to the, the life cycle and the replacement cycle of the battery, there will be constant state of health monitoring. Every time it goes into charge, data will be sent back uh, and accumulated and we'll be able to track the health of the batteries. That'll be particularly important, uh, you know, in the initial years of entry into service, uh, while we get real life applications of that technology back to the earlier question. Uh, and then, of course, will become more and more routine as we gain a, a broader body of knowledge. But it's it's part of our certification approach. Awesome. And yeah, so this is going through a type cert for FAA uh, under, you said, Part 28? 20, 20, 23, and it's a Class 23. 3 Part 23 aircraft, so commuter category aircraft. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much, Gregory. That was fantastic. 
Um, if if you guys want to post uh, either a link or a way to contact you guys, feel free. Um, and and thank you for coming. Next up, we have Atlas Devices. Presenting for Atlas Devices are Nate and Gino. Um, let me quickly just. All right, perfect. Um, Greg, if you'd mind, stop sharing. Actually, I could just get myself. Yeah, perfect. So Nate and Gino, feel free to uh, start your share whenever, whenever you'd like. Thanks. Can you guys know when that's up? I can see you and hear you. Good to go. Thanks. Hi, folks. My name is Nate Ball. I'm co-founder and CEO of Atlas Devices, or a small company based in the Boston area. And we've been in business for 17 years. Um, we focus on technologies uh, that let professionals in high-risk occupations work higher, faster, and safer. Uh, we're going to be talking about a capability gap that we address with some of our technology relating to hoisting, uh, especially for Air Force users. Our system, uh, as conceived here, is called Infinite Hoist. We work in four different areas. Uh, we have a lot of tactical presence, a growing amount of business in the utility sector, uh, a growing amount in aircraft, and then a steady stream of special projects. The capability gap we wanna talk about is uh, relating to hoisting with conventional technology uh, as hoists are typically deployed across different rotary wing aircraft. Specifically, uh, some of our end users in the pararescue community encounter three different uh, capability gaps that relate to, to many other analogous situations across the flight sector. One is um, the certain rescue squadrons uh, that don't have their own aircraft that's dedicated can wind up flying on joint aircraft that doesn't necessarily have a hoist equipped. That presents a, a major challenge when those units are tasked with personnel recovery and, and combat search and rescue. Uh, a second scenario that can be typical is existing hoists can't reach. Um, typical hoists uh, wind their cables onto a drum, so you have a fixed length, typically maxing out about 300 feet. Some scenarios would require a longer hoist, particularly in high angle terrain. And in other scenarios where a casualty might be on the inside of a building, a uh, pararescue man would have to extract that person to the top of the building to be able to bring them up with the typical hoist. And uh, you can't reach that cable safely inside the building. In the third scenario, and this is actually the, the use case that drove the Coast Guard's adoption of this technology as a backup hoist, their existing hoist can fail. You can have a cable entanglement that can be a hydraulic issue or an electrical issue. And so uh, having a backup available, particularly a lightweight one, which we can provide, becomes a pretty interesting uh, and compelling thing to use. The way that we do this is by repurposing uh, a, a well-used and uh, strong track record technology, the APA5 powered ascender. This has uh, been something we've been building for over a decade. It's been deployed around the world in defense and utility scenarios, and a growing number of um, other interesting use cases like shown on the right. Uh, typical applications are for vessel boarding, uh, and live transmission use, as you can see in the middle picture. This thing operates kind of like a power drill on steroids and it climbs ropes. So separable battery, variable speed, lifts directly uh, 600 pounds and it clips into typical climbing equipment like you would always have on a, on a harness and easily attaches to the aircraft by those techniques. In the aircraft employment scenario, uh, it's quite simple to use. This is a cross section of an H60 platform with a fries bar installed for fast rope insertion extraction. You uh, clip the pulley to the overhead point, put our uh, ascender on, uh, locked into the floor with our floor rings and uh, a couple of carabiners and off you go. This is a short video showing it being employed uh, in this capacity. It's clipped off of a fries bar there. The operators got pretty easy control. Um, the, the ropes we use are dramatically stronger than typical hoist cables as well. And part of what expands the capability of this technology as compared to a conventional hoist is the fact that uh, it climbs along the rope instead of winding it onto a drum, hence our, our infinite hoist name. Uh, if you have a thousand foot long rope, you can do a thousand foot hoist. And that's something that actually has been needed to be done in certain scenarios, uh, such as a uh, recovery in Norway that we've seen some video of. So the system works well. It's actually uh, airworthy already on the Coast Guard Jayhawk platform. And our, uh, our users in the Air Force want and need for it to be airworthy on 60s uh, in the Air Force. And so that's what we're going for. In the scenario where uh, you need to extend the reach of the hoist, this is something conventional hoist cannot do. Uh, you can actually rappel down on the device itself, take it into the building, get the casualty to the roof, and then 
get yourself back up to the top. And so our, our inf infinite hoist that comes from the APA5 ascender uh, addresses these three major capability gaps in a, in a compelling and, and safe way with a proven track record, both uh, for flight on the Coast Guard side and across a wide range of environments um, in other use cases. It has a lot of certifications under its belt at this point. Um, it's, it's also airworthy on the MI-17 in Poland for SAR aircraft. It's gone through all the, the Navy and multiple DOD safety tests and passed them all with flying colors. And uh, we're excited about its potential. What we're looking for is uh, to get an airworthiness release for the Air Force so our Air Force customers can fly this on their pay box. Um, we are uh, selected and not funded in this last uh, efforts direct to phase two round. So we're re-upping on that attempt uh, later in November. We're looking for connections to government and other stakeholders uh, who are concerned with personnel recovery, SAR, medevac, and uh, aiming for good connections and letters of support uh, to help us pursue this further. Thank you for your time. Awesome, thank you so much, Nate. Thank you so much. All right, first up is Joe McRae. Joe, go right ahead. Hey, Nate, uh, that was really good. I used to work with uh, the Special Warfare Training Wing with their innovation cell. So uh, awesome. I do have some, some PJ contacts. I'm just wondering what, uh, what rescue squadrons have you currently worked with or were able to get the MOUs with to get to Yeah, you bet. Two? Our current MOU is with the 308 um, out of Patrick. And so they're, uh, they're looking to fly this as, as soon as they have an AWR. Uh, but we have uh, numerous, there's a bunch of STS and RQS units that have uh, APA5 ascenders that would be uh, delighted to get to fly them. Uh, our most recent effort was with the 125th STS uh, out here in, the, in Portland, Oregon. And then uh, follow up, um, have you talked to any NATO uh, countries? You mentioned a Norway rescue, so I'm just wondering if any other countries are jumping in on this. Yes, uh, there are. In fact, we have uh, units flying on SAR aircraft in Poland. Um, where it, it also has an airworthiness release. Uh, there's um, growing interest from our Norwegian uh, contacts as well, but that's been kind of the extent of it so far. So if you have NATO contacts uh, that would be interested, we'd be delighted to have, uh, have info. Thank cool, you. thanks, Nate. I'll reach out. Appreciate it, Joe. Perfect. Next up is Martina. Martina, go right ahead. This is going to be actually a good operational tactic to be tested in the Balkans since Macedonia joined NATO recently and the military. Um, I'm more concerned about the commercial sector. Um, sure. Where commercially have you actually considered implementing this um, as out of rescue missions? Have you potentially um, thought about maybe analog missions? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, similar applications in for the hoisting capacity across the commercial sector and also uh, for other you know, munis municipalities, sheriff's departments that fly aircraft that would like to do search and rescue missions. Mm -hmm. One great example for the aircraft application is uh, in firefighting applications where a lot of private helicopter contractors are used for firefighting. They're, they're running hell attack missions. They're bringing Bambi buckets to perform firefighting. And they typically have to have search and rescue capability on standby uh, from a National Guard unit um, that's often not located near where the firefighting you know, hella base is happening. So uh, being able to deploy these as a bring aboard capability is, a, is an exciting uh, application there. And then commercially, we have quite a few units in the field in the utility sector. In those cases, they're doing structure and tower climbing. They'll actually launch pilot lines over live transmission lines and use our ascenders to climb up. Um, and so in terms of the technology being deployed commercially, we have good traction there um, and are excited about the growth potential there too. Thank you, Nate. Reach out to me. I might be able to help. I like that. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nate. That was fantastic. My pleasure. Um, free to leave some information in the chat if you'd like. If not, that's also okay. All right. Next up, we have Maiman Aerospace. And presenting for Maiman Aerospace will be Dan. Dan, are you with us? Yep, I'm here. Oh, there you are. Free to share when you're ready. Yep, just a second. Okay, oh, I shared everything okay? I see it. It's not in presenter mode, so if you want to full screen it, feel free. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to leave it at the moment. Is that all right? Sure. Just instead of fussing around with it. 
That's fine. Wait, sorry about that. Um, no. Wait, so Mimin Aerospace is a um, young venture uh, VC backed company. And I want to just first say kudos to everybody beforehand. It's pretty exciting, uh, especially to Gregory. We we're a big fan of uh, eVTOL. And I, sort of, I say that because what I want to say is we are not eVTOL. We are a, an air utility vehicle. Uh, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So the problem that we identify is um, we think there's a gap between helicopters, drones, and eVTOL in the vertical takeoff and landing space. Helicopters obviously are large and complicated, require pilots and training. Drones, although they're coming along very quickly, still have quite low payloads, limited range, and they're rather slow. And eVTOLs, which are super exciting, um, still have limitations of range and they're rather large and there are battery considerations. Our solution is to use uh, heavy fuels and we've created something called Speeder, which is um, an air utility vehicle powered by turbine engines. Uh, at the moment, we're modeling about 600 pound payload lift. We estimate about 500 miles per hour speed. Uh, the one that we're primarily focusing on is about the size of a large motorcycle uh, and it can be flown autonomously, remote or piloted. Uh, the advantages uh, we think on performance versus cost, we have very high performance and relatively low cost compared to say a helicopter. Uh, we have very high speed and very a long range and the payload for the size, uh, we think there's nothing that competes with it. Uh, it's built on a modular frame. We are, we are agnostic as to what the features are. What we're building is this flying turbine platform and our secret sauce is in controlling the engines, the, the gimbal, the jet evaders, which I'll show you in a moment. So we can take this modular frame and apply it to a number of different uh, use cases, which we'll show you. We are talking about at the moment, this motorcycle size one, but we are currently now developing a suitcase, so it's basically the size of a large trunk, which uh, this sort of came out of a lot of conversations with various uh, DODs uh, for use in the Ukraine. And we can make a very large one for uh, contested logistics delivery, which we'll see in a second here. So the four use cases that we see are military for contested logistics. We can swarm them. They can be uh, launched and controlled on the ground or by remote. Uh, they're impervious to weather, to uh, landing terrains, et cetera. There's very little, there's plug and play. There's no uh, transmission systems or such. They're easy to maintain in the field. Second one would be critical cargo, something like uh, servicing offshore oil rigs, where if a part goes down, a rig it costs about a million bucks a day if it can't get something because of bad weather. We've talked to several service providers uh, in the Gulf, and they want to take these and, and um, station them on different rigs so they can hop from rig to rig. The third use case would be in wildland fires. When the big tankers or the big helicopters are dealing with the main flames, there are little fires that are breaking out all over the place and the firefighters on the ground want a way to quickly get uh, fire suppression, whether it's water, retardant, et cetera, to little areas on the ground. And this way they can control the air locally as needed. And again, these can be swarmed. So you can have dozens of these speeders dropping water where it's needed and, and flexible. And lastly, which might be the largest market, but obviously the longest, longest to market because of uh, regulations, we see a disaster recovery and emergency medical services where we can evacuate uh, casualties, we can bring in medicine, supplies, generators, et cetera. Uh, as I said, it's a relatively young company. In three years, we have built, uh, we have three flying prototypes. Uh, we customize repulsion. We do use off the, off the shelf turbines that are modified to our specification. Our secret sauce is the in-house computer system that controls the balance thrust vectoring of the engines. The frame is modular and we are dual use. Uh, our staff we think is second to none. They, they've built things that nobody else has seemed to have been able to achieve yet. We have three prototypes. Uh, the first one on the left was a proof of concept. Uh, also is did all the physics modeling where the engines go. The P1.5 in the middle uh, proved that we can fly, control, take off land, transition, et cetera. And now we're flying our P2 which is the one on the right. This is the other ones before were renderings. This is the actual P2. This is not a rendering. This is a photograph of the unit that we are testing. It's a real pilot on a real unit. As I say, we're not going to be piloting right off the bat, but this is also gives you the scale of what we're building. So this is actual real. 
Uh, here are the eight engines in four clusters. Specifically, we can control the gimbal of the engine and we can control those little rings at the bottom, the, the jet uh, vectoring control as well, and balance the eight engines. If one fails, the seven engines will carry it no problem. So this is really what our secret sauce is. Um, here are the units on the left is just sort of the, the sexy look of the prototype. The one on the right, we added a cargo rack so we can do testing. The shape may change to be more utilitarian when we deliver it, but this is the type of unit that will be um, the primary uh, contested logistics unit, certainly for the military to begin with. Here's our, our shots. Morning. Here's our shots out on the tether in our thing, uh, in our testing center. Here's some more shots. Um, okay, we, we are working with, uh, we have a direct two, a direct to phase two Sibber that was uh, already funded for one and a quarter million. We're working with the MARSAC with the BIA. We're working with Australian Military of Defense, DARPA, the UK. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to skip here. And we're currently in a, a pre-series A looking for 30 million. So time is a little off, but there we go. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, first up in the q and it looks like we have Corey Anderson. Corey, go right ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much. A great brief. And uh, I agree with you on the gap that you're trying to fill. The questions that I have are regarding the fuel burn and how much flight time do you believe you're going to get out of this uh, prototype two that you've done so far? Yep, excellent question that we get all the time. And the answer is a little bit squishy. It depends on the configuration, meaning we're trying to build it with the smallest wing possible. And it depends on obviously on payload. So as I said, we are agnostic. The, the control system is what, is what our specialty is. So at the moment, the P2 looks like it has around a 70, uh, 150 mile range with about a, a 600 pound uh, payload, but that can be scaled up or down based on the mission. So if the unit will follow the mission, the mission won't follow the unit. Okay, and my second question um, is the amount of electrical power that uh, you're able to produce from the generators. I don't believe we got to talk that much. Yes, um, that varies also, and I'd be happy to discuss that offline on NDA. Okay, sir, thank you. Perfect, perfect, thank you, Corey. Next up, we have Bob Christopher. Bob, go right ahead. Very impressive. Um, I'm curious about your communication system. What are you using for communicating with uh, both the ground and also with any other types of uh, airborne yep. uh, um, uh, you know, mobility, if you want to call that, um, devices? So, I, I this is an interesting area because I I ran into I work with people in this space, and one of the big challenges they say around cities and and uh, large urban areas is the communication between other devices drones and others. And I'm just kind of wondering how you are, how you are approaching that. Yep, another great question that we get quite a bit. Uh, first of all, we don't really envision this to be an urban um, flight vehicle for a long time to come. That will probably be electric. I mean, they are turbine, they are loud, they are powerful, etc. cetera. Uh, and the communication system itself for navigation as, as we said, we are sort of agnostic. We are working at the moment with near earth autonomy and a number of others. And we will, depending on the mission, it will, it will vary as to which system we use and also what the client wants. As far as actually um, control system, again, we like, for example, MARSAC had a particular uh, request and AFWorks had a different request. So our system is, is configurable and we are agnostic on the system itself. Are you considering using um, cameras and other sensors to gather data along the flight path? I'm just thinking about uh, additional value you can, you can extract and, and, and uh, charge for. Um, is that something you're, you're looking at? Yes, 100%. Absolutely. That's been a, a, a big discussion. And again, I, I forgive me, but it depends on what the client wants, what the use case is. But the answer is yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Nice presentation. Thank you. Perfect. Next up, we have Matt McGregor. Last question. Yeah, like uh, like others said, that's uh, really impressive. Um, 
I, I just had a question about reliability. A lot of times the thing that comes up with uh, unmanned systems is that, you know, uh, how, how are they maintained, especially if they're intended to operate fairly autonomously. Do you, have you guys gotten enough flight hours to kind of be able to see what the uptime and what that what that would be, what what that would take uh, on a you know, recurring basis? Right. Uh, the answer is no, and that's why we're raising money. Uh, at the moment, we're limited really to tether flying. We're just waiting for our FAA uh, certification to go off tether, but we do have. Um, we are in conversation with AFWorks, for example, and Morisoc to get some military flight uh, ranges where we can really turn this thing on to the desert till it crashes. So we're very young, it's very new. We've just started flying this thing. Uh, so the answer is no, but that's something we need to work on. Okay, yeah, yeah, I get you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. it, it's, I, I will say that, you know, it, this has been built from zero to Second, the third prototype in less than three years with very, very little money. Our total raise so far is just over $6 million. And, you know, we already have this working prototype of, with a lot of interest. So we're, we're moving faster than we, than we had anticipated. Perfect. Thank you so, so much, Dan. Um, so that concludes our open topic session. Thank you for everyone who joined. Uh, the next, the next session is going to be the space session, and I'm really happy to share the, the companies. So we're going to start off with Precursor SPC, followed by Zephyr Computing, followed by Nova Space, followed by Equatorial Space, followed by an Orbit Aerospace, and then we have the Space Gold Corporation, Hyperspace Propulsion, then Target Arm. Um, in terms of the panelists, we're running a little short on time. Uh, so for this, for this round, what we're going to do is every time uh, a panelist asks a question for the first time, uh, quickly introduce yourself and uh, give a little background. And so that way we'll be able to keep the show running on time. Um, so without further ado, if Clive is ready and all queued up, um, Clive, you should be good to uh, start sharing. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Asher. Let me uh, share my screen. Perfect. Uh... Here is the that work? Yep. You see my screen? Okay, great. Yep. Great. Uh, well, <clears throat> let's uh, let's go. Um, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. Our mission is to be the global provider of commercial space environment information and services to the space economy. Initially, we're delivering first-of-a-kind space weather now casting services to both launch and in-orbit space operators, as well as the financial services industry that underpins the entire space economy. Additionally, in sequence, Precursor is launching a global earthquake and tsunami forecasting service with our multinational corporate partners. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Precursor's innovations are in the real-time monitoring and real-time analysis of the space environment using proprietary machine learning algorithms of the actual dynamic EM energy profile of and over the Earth. These are the foundations for our first-of-a-kind commercial space weather services that are real-time, high-fidelity, high-resolution, actionable information. Our business model is to deliver cloud-based subscription services we do not put up satellites or build hardware. Insight and actionable information are the into or for the actual space environment are fundamental to all aspects of space and space commercialization. Spending today on space weather is estimated at $10 billion globally. We believe we can both shift existing spending to precursor space weather services and create new sizable revenue opportunities by delivering a monitoring and real-time actionable information value proposition as services, ultimately growing the market to 35 billion in 10 years. Precursor's value proposition to private and government space operators, critical infrastructure providers, financial services organizations, and both civilian and national security agencies is to realize the economic value of their high value assets and applications and to mitigate the risks to these high value assets, missions and applications. Along this increasing value chain, 
Precursor delivers first of a kind paid for space weather services to decision makers. We deliver these services as subscription data and analytic services in three markets, space, space commercialization, and earthquake and tsunami risk. The value we deliver comes from delivering high value services integrated into operational systems, predictive analytic systems, con ops and decision support systems. Our approach is unique and a fundamentally different concept of competition. This concept is to provide monitoring and real time data and data analytic services of the actual environment. Delivering space weather services, precursors space weather concept of operation is illustrated here. This con ops is a foundational element of our competitive advantage. Similarly, we're providing actionable information about the actual space environment for real-time decisions that impact the operations, decisions, performance, risk, and economics of businesses or organizations impacted by the space environment or situations identified in the space environment. Delivering our space weather services, our tsunami and earthquake forecasting concept of operations is illustrated here. Over the past three years, we've established considerable traction across all three market segments. We're the only company that we know of that has received direct endorsement from NOAA specifically for our space weather now casting capability and the earthquake and tsunami forecasting capability that enables. We are working with DARPA, NRO, and US Space Force on specific use of our space weather now casting capability for their missions and uh, objectives. We have corporate partnerships in aerospace, space, reinsurance and cloud computing for the commercial space economy. Our team is uniquely experienced with multiple past successes delivering high performance mission critical systems. We have deep strengths in atmospheric physics, geophysics, space systems, and machine learning predictive analytics. We have built businesses before, achieved customer success, and exited with significant returns for our investors. Based on what customers are telling us, Precursor's unique capabilities and compelling value proposition are essential to the space economy. That's, uh, that's my presentation. Um, feel free to contact me uh, at the email above. If this is uh, of, of interest, we're looking for um, additional customer opportunities in um, Air Force, Space Force, uh, and the intelligence community, as well as uh, commercial partnerships. Um, that's, a, that's about it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Clyde. Uh, first up with a question, we have Corey Anderson. Yep. Corey, go right ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, I work at the U.S. Army ISR Task Force to uh, identify key technologies that might, you know, help identify uh, anomalies in the battle space to include uh, an environmental intelligence activity that we have going on that uses now casting technologies um, for internal to the atmosphere. How much of your predictive analytics are based on models that you have to use from other services? Zero. That is the power of our solution it is not based on models. It is based on, it is a data driven uh, assessment based on the actual um, environment and the evolving or changing conditions in that environment. Models and um, assumptions introduce biases and um, inconsistencies that you know, result in very significant uh, discrepancies between what's actually happening and, uh, and what the model says. The, the easiest one just out of this way is all the models say that no such thing as uh, the energy buildup before an earthquake can exist in the ionosphere. But it's been shown hundreds of times by NOAA, by NASA, by 
Space Force, by the Europeans, by the Russians, by the Japanese, that there is a distinct signature in the ionosphere prior to moderate to severe earthquakes. No model even shows that even exists. Hence, we built the real-time high fidelity capability of what's actually happening in the space environment. And that's being used by the different uh, groups that I mentioned there for precision PNT, for tracking and discrimination, for uh, high performance RF communications. So, Interesting. So, so on the predictive analytics side of this, though, if you're collecting real time data, how in 4D, you know, predictively with time, right, the fourth dimension, how do you predict yeah. into the future without a model of some type being created by your real time analytics? Uh, we start with the actual space environment as the foundation. Um, and then from that actual space environment, we gather um, uh, data, we fuse data from multiple sources to provide a predictive assessment of the impacts of the different, um, uh, different phenomena that will potentially, obviously there is a statistical element to it, that will potentially impact uh, the environment going forward. So we use, awesome. a, we, use a, we use a Bayesian inference engine uh, and use a Kalman filter-based data fusion approach to provide that, um, that forecasting insight. Okay, great. And uh, no, I appreciate that. And uh, the, the very last question, and I'm sorry to drag this out, but as that data is accumulated, how do you get truth data after the fact of to say, yeah, our model was off or our forecast was off uh, and we need to adjust. What are you using as truth data? Uh, we use uh, validation and verification for the ionosphere using incoherent scatter radar. Awesome, thank you, sir. Appreciate the insight. Yep. Perfect, thank you so much, Clyde. Last question, Tim Denning. Tim, would you mind? Quickly introducing yourself before asking the question, just so Clyde sure. has some context. Yeah, I'm Tim Denning, um, a principal with UltraTech Capital Partners, which is a dual use investor, early stage deep tech dual use here in the DC area. Um, and Clyde, good to see, good to hear you again. Um, quick question for you, actually twofold. Can you tell me how you see the market, the size of the addressable market for this capability, and what revenue are you currently enjoying? Over. Um, the, you know, we see the, the existing, as I mentioned at the beginning, the existing spend for space weather, both systems and services is, uh, skewed toward the systems. Uh, and it is roughly around $10 billion annually. We see by introducing a, the services component and taking advantage of existing systems, um, we and providing this real time high fidelity capability that will go feed directly into workflows and, and decision support systems, we can significantly increase the, uh, the opportunities both uh, by transitioning existing legacy services um, as what, for example, with NRO or with Space Force or Air Force, um, but also introducing new capabilities for the commercial space segment uh, which they're asking for, you know, the launch operators and the satellite operators. Uh, today, we have existing revenue, uh, a little over a million dollars um, this year. Next year, we should do um, somewhere around six or seven, depending. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Clive. Clive. Feel free to leave um, some information for the hosts and panelists or even the attendees to contact you. Um, otherwise, if uh, if someone wants to speak with Clive, they can also come through me directly and I'll, I'll be happy to make the introduction. Um, thank you so much, Clive. That was fantastic. And to, to continue on, next up in the space segment, we have Zephyr Computing. Um, Presenting for Zephyr is Jason. Uh, Jason, the floor is yours when you're ready. Feel free to share your screen. All right, just give me one second here. All right, uh, yeah, thank you so much for the, the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm excited to uh, 
tell you about Zephyr Computing Systems. So uh, we're building supercomputers for satellites. And uh, the reason that we're focused on that is uh, the exponential growth in the amount of data that's being generated on orbit. Uh, so not only is the number of satellites growing exponentially, but each individual satellite is also generating more and more data. And we believe that the solution to this is edge computing. So this is where you perform the data processing on the same platform that's collecting the data uh, before you downlink it to the ground. And to support this, we're creating uh, our own rad tolerant semiconductors and custom algorithms uh, to build uh, the next generation of computing, computing systems for space. So a little bit about our approach. Uh, we're building uh, an edge computing platform to support AI and ML workloads. Uh, we're focused on uh, using the latest terrestrial chips uh, that de uh, developers on Earth are very familiar with and bringing them into the space environment. Uh, and of course, underlying all of that is uh, designing these systems for the harsh environment of space. Uh, so this is um, mitigating the effects of radiation and designing uh, unique thermal solutions. Uh, here's a look at our product line. So roughly, we're thinking about them in three categories. So uh, you have the computing systems that we talked about. Uh, but of course, you also need a way to uh, store the data. And we've started work on our own uh, custom RAD tolerant SSD design. Uh, and you also need to uh, get that data to the ground. Uh, and so we have plans for a uh, very high bandwidth software defined radio. And the reason that we're doing all this is to help our customers uh, maintain their edge in the market. So with our systems, they can uh, get to orbit faster. Uh, take advantage of our years of experience building these solutions uh, in the past. Um, and we're focused on building upon standardized open source solutions wherever possible uh, and really making the integration uh, as straightforward and smooth as possible. Uh, here's a little bit about our team. Uh, so we all grew up uh, learning about the Apollo missions and watching space shuttles fly regularly. And we're excited to be part of leading the, the next generation of the space industry. Uh, we all have experience both uh, here on the ground uh, and also designing solutions for space. Uh, in fact, all of us work together at Capella Space. Um, we built the software-defined radio system that they're using for synthetic aperture radar, onboard data processing, and high data rate downlink. And finally, a little look at our roadmap. So we were founded last year. We won NASA's Entrepreneurs Challenge. Uh, which gave us enough money to start uh, developing our core team and raise a pre-seed round. Uh, this year, we're focused on getting our first customers. Uh, we also were awarded a NASA SBIR uh, for the SSD uh, that I talked about earlier. Uh, and recently, we were accepted into the uh, first session of Creative Destruction Laboratory's uh, Space Stream. Uh, next year, our, uh, we're looking forward to building our flight heritage uh, with our first demo mission. And that'll let us demonstrate AI and ML workloads on orbit. Uh, and we'll be continuing work um, with our uh, custom NAND flash controller. Uh, after that, it's all about scaling things up, uh, supporting satellite constellations. Um, and then uh, long term, we're looking at getting into uh, missions beyond Earth orbit, so cislunar and even uh, interplanetary missions to Mars and beyond. Uh, today, uh, we're looking for uh, both uh, investment uh, to uh, fund our seed round, and that'll unlock our uh, growth in the near future. Uh, and we're also interested in talking to U.S. government customers, so specifically the U.S. Air Force uh, and the U.S. Space Force. So um, please feel free to reach out and uh, be happy to discuss things more. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over for questions. Sure, sure absolutely. Uh, Joe, you uh, had your hand up first. Go right ahead. Hi, Joe Epstein from Lockheed Martin Space. Um, of course, Jason, we're really interested in this technology. Um, I did have a quick question about your flight heritage, but you answered that in your following um, chart. So uh, are you working directly with U United States-based foundries? Or where are you getting your, uh, your chip designs mostly from right now? 
Yeah, uh, well, we're very excited to um, be part of bringing uh, back US-based semiconductor manufacturing. So we'd be uh, focused on the, the US right now, but we haven't finalized those plans just yet. Awesome. Stahl, um, you're up. Thank you. Hi, Solomon Cates, CTO of Cloud and Cyber at Talus. Um, one thing I sort of caught in there is you got some compute storage and other data center type uh, facilities. What's in your plans for securing some of those? Or are you leaving that up for your customers to handle the workloads themselves? Uh, yeah, so uh, right now we're mostly focused on building the hardware platform. So obviously that involves some amount of software to support the, uh, the hardware. Um, but in terms of the application software, that's a little bit outside of our scope, uh, at least right now, uh, given our limited resources. Um, in terms of security, we're using uh, industry standard uh, procedures, um, you know, all the stuff that um, any uh, terrestrial based company would do so frequent software updates and um, just following best practices. Okay, and just one double click on that. Um, any, any, you know, communication and encryption technologies you've adopted so far since you have long life in, in space? Uh, nothing, uh, nothing specific that I can mention right now, but uh, I'd be happy to put you in touch with our CTO who can answer uh, all your questions on that. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Next up, Corey Anderson. Hi, thanks. Uh, great brief. Uh, I know you're focused on the hardware platform side of this, but obviously with the, you know, the foundry question earlier and the ability to get uh, chipsets and SOMs and SOCs is, have you started looking at RISC-V as a potential ISA for your silicon chipsets. Uh, I saw an article recently where NASA has selected that for some of their satellites. And are you incorporating any of that uh, type of silicon chipsets for your activities? Over. Uh, yeah, we're we're definitely looking at a RISC V. Um, we we also have a lot of experience using other ARM chips, so that would be a, another natural uh, option for us. Um, and then uh, for our Custom NAND controller, um, uh, we're using Xilinx products, so uh, MicroBlaze has been coming up as a, a sort of an intermediary step. Uh, but yeah, Risk Five is definitely really exciting. Perfect. Bob, go right ahead. I'll make it quick. Um, really great presentation. Um, so I'm just interested, I, it looks like you're in uh, Oakland, right? Oakland, California? Yes, that's correct. Um, are you aware of Berkeley Labs and their and their work on um, uh, ruggedizing computer chips and electronics for space? There's an ongoing project right now that they're working on in this um, category. Oh, um, yeah, I'm not familiar with that project specifically, but um, yeah, I'm familiar with uh, Berkeley in general and uh, specifically for some of the radiation tests that they've been doing. We're working with them as well, so maybe we should have a, a chat at some point. Yeah, I'd be happy to continue talking about that. Okay, thank you. Awesome, awesome. Next up, Dan. Hey, uh, great uh, brief, Jason. Uh, just a question on some of the testing and some of the space flight qualifications that you're planning to do. Do you have any plans in place? I work with the uh, Space Systems Command, the innovation and prototype out here in Albuquerque. And mm -hmm. we do have some uh, opportunities to get things into space, but just curious on, on your qualification um, and what you're trying to do to get uh, space flight qualified. Yes, in terms of yes, uh, general qualification, we're just following the NASA standards for small sats. Uh, procedures that we're familiar with from uh, our previous work in the space industry. Um, in terms of radiation specific testing, uh, we looked at doing ground-based testing using uh, like getting beam time and so forth. And uh, the, the cost and timeline for that wound up being a roughly equivalent to just um, getting a demo flight on one of these hosted payload services. So uh, we decided to just go immediately to building flight heritage. Um, we're 
definitely interested in doing uh, ground-based testing uh, longer term, but um, yeah, just given the the timelines there, it's uh, a little bit prohibitive. Um, one one exciting option we're looking at is uh, we're talking to a company that has a laser-based system, uh, so it it can simulate some of the effects of radiation without needing a huge uh, cyclotron and you know, just, you know university scale uh, experiments. Okay, thank you. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Jason. Feel free to share your contact info. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that was fantastic. All right, so for the next company we have up, we have Nova Space and presenting for Nova Space is I believe either Joe or, or Christopher. Yes, uh, Joe Horvath, uh, right here. So ready to go if you're ready for me to share my screen. Yep. Sure. Sounds You're good cool. to go. Let's see. So let me know if the group can see this. We can see it. It's not on presentation mode for me at least yet. It's um, not. Yeah, I don't have it on presentation mode. I think this might actually be easier for me. Uh, if okay, that sounds perfect. So I'm Joe Horvath. I'm the CEO of Nova Space. Uh, very excited to be with this group today. Uh, it's been really uh, interesting listening to everybody talk. And um, I am the CEO and co-founder. Um, I come from a military and space background, and I partnered with uh, a long-term partner um, when we realized that there, there is a significant lack of training and professional development opportunities for both the space industry commercially and on the government side as well, and having come from both sides of it. Um, and, and so our mission is to provide uh, the ability for training and professional development for the space industry across the commercial and government side. And where you will have heard uh, the groups talk today about technical capabilities and uh, systems, our focus is on the people and what we need to do uh, better to grow um, that workforce uh, that can support both the commercial on the government side as we go forward. Um, so with that, I, I will start off, I've got a video here, I'm gonna play for a minute and then I'll go through slides for the rest of the time that I have available. Nova Space, embark on your next career adventure. Eliminate downtime, boost experience with our industry leading digital learning platform, cutting edge technologies, and simulated hands-on experiences. Gain key operations and astronautics knowledge to excel in the complex collaborative space-based initiatives expanding around the globe. Prepare for takeoff. Upgrade practical knowledge, practice decision-making, and develop effective team collaboration skills. Try the demo. Nova Space, setting a new standard in space professional development and training. So I'll stop it there and it goes on a little bit, but I think it's good. It, it gives a little bit of a feel for what we're trying to accomplish here. And I, I, I'll throw this slide out. The space industry a, as a whole, um, you know, essentially started well before cyber, well before multiple industries that, that you're familiar with, really with the launch of Sputnik in the 50s. But it's really changing drastically currently because of the commercial space side. So when you see the blue at the bottom there, that's the old space workforce that was primarily made up of NASA, the DOD, and the federal contractors and primes that supported those efforts. And it was a very niche specific field where a few people would retire each year, a few people would, would join each year, but the way that they did training, education, and professional development for that entire industry was really through on-the-job training and direct mentorship. The problem is, as you can see there, since the SpaceX was successful with their Falcon 1 launch, I'm going to call that the paradigm shift there. That's when things changed and space really started to become a commercial industry, which at this point, um, both Morgan Stanley and City are both considering space to likely be a $1 trillion annual industry by 2040. There's this enormous growth of the workforce 
and the talent required in order to accomplish that. We see tons of commercial space companies coming online right now. Um, and we've also got the rise of the Space Force and the integration of space on the government side. But nobody's really focused on how we, we support the people that are going to actually accomplish the goals. Um, the technology and the capability development is one thing, but without training and providing a professional development path throughout their careers for this entire group of people, whether it's onboarding, uh, you know, recruiting, retention, or the upskilling of those employees throughout their careers, uh, we're never going to reach that goal um, that they're predicting by the 2040s. And that's the, the essence of why Nova Space was created. We uh, have been around about a year and a half. Uh, we've developed a very specific uh, fundamental and standardized level of uh, space training and education provided both for the government and industry. And I'll get into the, our current customers at this point. Um, but we've had re resounding success so far. And the reason why is because we don't teach based on uh, what you would think of kind of those old school or traditional methods um, such as lectures and or, or whether it's in-person lectures or video lectures um, or click through a PowerPoint presentation and answer some questions at the end. The way we approach training and professional development is through actually allowing people to practice those skills and try using those skills in real world environments, very similar to what they're gonna see on the job. And, and that's the kind of learning that stays with somebody. It affects their future performance and their behaviors in a way that you're not gonna get through the type of thing that many of us who have DOD backgrounds are used to, the click through the thing, you answer the questions, you get the certificate, and then you're done. And you, know, you did it as fast as possible. Our goal is to make things that are interesting and that people want to uh, be a part of and they find it career enhancing. We have a number of early, what's that? 30 second warning. Okay, we, we've got a number of early adopters, uh, both across the government side, as you can see on the left there with multiple units, uh, as well as industry as well. Um, we currently go after three types of revenue models, essentially. One is corporate licensing, where we offer the ability for companies to do a multi-year license where they can access this type of professional development for everyone they want in their company, going after that recruiting, uh, retaining, and upskilling within their employee base. We've also designed our courses, and actually one of our course designers is a former National Security Space Institute instructor. Uh, so we're working with multiple DOD agencies at this point, both on the DOD and intelligence community side. And then we also allow for individuals who are looking to enter the space industry to take our courses online through our learning management system. We're currently seeking an investment of $10 million to expand two specific areas. One, our sales and marketing team so that we can go after more of these clients because we're a small company. And the other side is to build out our current course load. Um, and I'd like to mention that we have earned the Space Foundation's certification for education. Uh, we've also uh, won three awards uh, in learning and development for our, our courses so far through the Brendan Hall Group. And we have partnerships both with the Space Foundation, the Keystone Space Collaborative based on the Northeast, uh, and with FedLearn as well. Our current curriculum is very much based on uh, the fundamental pillars of what is necessary to be successful through communication, uh, interacting with teams, and uh, understanding user and stakeholder needs uh, within space. Um, the next step that we're looking to do is build that out so it becomes a career platform. So think about PMI, if you will, like for project management. That's what we're doing for space, is building that lifelong a career platform for people to both get the, the foundational information they need to be successful on a space career, but then also to progress through that to the more senior levels um, of being able to be a project manager, a leader, um, and, and, uh, and get away from the model of simply OJT, which essentially is uh, ineffective, non-standardized, and really doesn't help companies both on the government and the industry side succeed uh, with their performance goals. So um, I think I'm probably about there on my time there. Then let's, Ash, start, let's start wrapping up here. Questions. So, yep. Okay, perfect. Let's go, let's go to questions. So Joe, you're, you're first up. 
Hi, uh, Joe. I have a quick question. Is there is this training in modulars that is, uh, you know, kind of captured material, or is there a part that's got a, a, a VR AR element to it? So one of the things right now, um, what traditional training is very much, uh, and any competitor that we have, which essentially there are very few in the space industry right now, but they are all focused on, they give video lectures or they give PowerPoint type click-through presentations. And, and I'm happy to connect with you after and show you um, our stuff is very much based on performance and behavior change. So you're actually practicing doing the things that you're learning so that you can apply them uh, to your job. Whether you're a scientist, engineer, project manager, lawyer, HR, uh, we work with a number of companies across industry where you know it's a lot easier to take a salesperson and teach them what they need to know about space to be successful for that company rather than take an engineer and make them a salesperson, if you know what I mean, right? So um, our stuff is very focused on being simulation-based and, and doing through practicing so that you walk away comfortable that you can apply the things that you've been learning into your day-to-day -day job, your day-to-day -day interactions. Um, and so does that kind of get at your question? Okay. And I, I'm happy to show plenty of demonstrations. We have free courses that are available as well for anyone interested that wants to kind of get a feel for, for how we approach that. All right, James, you're up next. And then after that, Steve. Gotcha. Thanks. Uh, my name is James Shuri. I'm the Deputy Director and Chief Innovation Officer for a group called the Translational Research Institute for Space Health. And I love that you're focused on the human. Uh, we're focused on, on making humans healthy in space and productive in space, including all of the medical needs and research uh, on multiple flights and multiple carriers. Um, I, I love that your content is in this direction. I was wondering if you were willing to add content that would speak to basically the human engaging in space. So, so not just, um, you know, how space systems are, are made and launched and modeled, but also if you do have to have miners up there, you know, what would be the space parameters that would allow a company to work into that area? And if, if you're either have that on your future plan, then that may be something that we would, could potentially help you with. Yeah, James, I, I, uh, I appreciate that. And yes. So one of the things that we're doing when I show our future kind of areas that we're looking to expand into to create that, like I said, right now, we're, have been focused for our first stage on kind of that fundamental standardization right. level of knowledge. The next step is to mm -hmm. add what you hear, which is building it uh, further to provide career opportunities to get into other areas. And so, yes, I would 100% agree with you that that um, that is an area that a number of companies, both working with NASA and the DoD, are are in need of understanding the human element of a human spaceflight, right, and all the uh, the different ins and outs of aspects that go along with that. So, yes, uh, let's connect after this, and uh, I'd love to get your feedback and and see what we can do. Thank you. Perfect. Next and last question, we got Steve. Steve, yes, go right ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Steve Testa, Space Systems Command, SZBC Directorate. Uh, and front door for liaison. Uh, you may have heard the latest motto uh, is to build what we have to and buy what we can. This definitely seems to fit that mold. And I was curious if you have had any dialogue with Star Command, uh, which is the uh, Space Training and Readiness Command. And if, if not, um, I would encourage you to maybe either reach out to me or to reach out to the SSC front door portal. Over. Yeah, Steve, I really appreciate it. it you know, obviously breaking into uh, Space Command and the Space Force is a challenge. And, and I have, I, I'm a retired military. I was a space officer in the Marine Corps in my previous life. And so I have connections into all those things. But the reality is, is that the incumbents, if you will, that, that lead the National Security Space Institute and some of those things, um, you know, th those are challenges, but I will tell you their focus is not on building that digital force because they don't have the expertise for it. Um, and it's a different style of teaching and learning that if you don't have the background for, you know, what they're essentially producing right now is video lectures that are in place of in-person lectures, but it, it doesn't give them the chance and that human performance element of being able to uh, practice doing what they're learning and actually then for you tracking how they're doing and understanding in data sets what needs more focus, what we should be focusing on more, what people do well at, what they don't do well at, 
all those aspects of it. We currently work uh, right now with Colonel Drake at Spacecom, and he is uh, one of our advocates on, on that end. I have some inroads into NSSI, but Steve, I would love to connect with you and, and see what we can do to help press this forward. And you know, as a former military guy and the, the Space Force looking to develop um, a truly digital force as a focus, I think that what we can do is augment that where you can do a lot of the fundamental learning digitally, and they, then you, you, you use very sparingly and smartly the in-person time for that networking, team building, and further exploration so that you're not spending time teaching basic concepts and things that um, could be better spent um, with the in-person time to focus on lessons learned and that mentorship and growth. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Feel free to leave some of your contact info uh, in the chat. Uh, next up, we have Simon. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. Next up, we have Simon presenting for Equatorial Space. Simon, whenever you're ready, feel free to share. All right, thank you, Asher. Thanks for, ha for having me today, and uh, great to see everyone. All righty, can you see my slides? Yeah, not presentation mode yet, but we can see them. All righty, how about now? Uh, there we go, we're good. Okay, fantastic. All righty, so we are Equatorial Space. Um, in case you're wondering why are we called Equatorial, is because the company was initially formed in Singapore. So um, I'm Simon, I'm the founder and CEO, and uh, together with my co-founder Praveen, we were basically seeking opportunities building rockets in our country here until we realized that there were none until we created our own opportunities back in 2017. Uh, initially, we were mostly originalized play, but uh, we have uh, with, with great serendipity, we met Jamie Anderson, who's our CTO and developer behind the technologies that we've got. Jamie spent 30 years, uh, pretty much his entire career, advancing the field of hybrid rocket propulsion. He, form, he was formerly uh, associated with the American rocket company in California in the early 90s. Uh, he was uh, founder of the Australian Space Launch Initiative, and he was uh, later the uh, head of propulsion at Gilmore Space before joining us as CTO. Uh, also joining us is Marcelo Martinez, who is our VP of Fly Dynamics. Uh, he goes back 40 years building UAVs, ballistic missiles, and sounding rockets in the US, Argentina, and Europe. And uh, he's currently working uh, with our flight anal dynamics analysis. We are also supported by our board of advisors, which is very US-centric, as you can tell. Glenn Haskins is a GNC expert, formerly from Lockheed Martin. Uh, he was involved in the Patri Patriot program. Sandeep built the avionics platform for the Curiosity rover back at JPL. Uh, he's currently with Lockheed Martin as well. Mao Derry, there is a propulsion expert, formerly from Airjet Rocketdyne, SpaceX, and both Virgin companies. And uh, at last but not least, is our uh, mentor from the Techstars program in LA, uh, Andrew Shapiro, who is a materials expert, formerly from JPL as well. Alrighty, so imagine a world if every single airline had to develop their engines from scratch. I don't think aviation would have ever taken off, and surely we would not be living in the global village that we inhabit right now. And that's unfortunately the exact situation in the space launch industry right now. And every new entrant is basically forced to repeat the cycle of uh, boom and bust and burn through already scarce capital, trying to get uh, through, through their technological milestones. That's not a trivial problem because propulsion typically would account for around 75% of development costs of a new launcher and accounts for roughly 50% of root failure causes uh, afflicting launch vehicles. It is the main barrier to entry, working on new vehicles who just end up essentially reinventing the wheel all the time. The reality is contemporary rocket systems are simply not good enough to meet our spacefaring aspirations as a species. They remain risky, they generate a lot of greenhouse gases, which is a growing concern, and they are also mind-bogglingly complicated still after all these years. If every single time I look at, uh, you know, Starship and uh, I see that spaghetti web of, 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 of plumbing you know, on the business end, you know, I just get a headache. This is exactly what we have stepped in to resolve. So what we, we, we the, the key to transforming the economics and risk profile of spaceflight um, and many other uh, applications that, that require use of chemical rocket propulsion, we have focused our attention on hybrids, which is a lesser known cousin of liquids and solids. Hybrids are remarkably straightforward and they are economical since they use a combination and, and economic because they only use one liquid. So that, uh, that reduces the complexity of the plumbing system a lot. 
and at the same time, they, uh, they are actually inert by themselves because they separate uh, fuel and oxidizer into two states of matter. So historically, they were limited by their performance, but we have resolved those past limitations with proprietary IP that I will focus in uh, and that I will get to very shortly. But firstly, to illustrate the safety, let's, well, you know, I like to say that we plan for failure when we, when we uh, decide to use hybrids for a particular application, because while they are combustible, they have to be energetic, they don't actually blow up if something goes wrong, you know, and that does not create an overpressure event that would otherwise be catastrophic for payload and surrounding infrastructure or personnel that's, that's involved. They are technically speaking non-sensitive. They are also, because of their simplicity, they are the most cost-effective way of having a rocket that you can actually throttle in flight conditions or shut down or restart depending on their design and because, because of, uh, you know, depending on your requirements. And that makes them very attractive in several defense applications as well. So now you might be wondering, if hybrids are really so great, then why are they not used in all kinds of places all the time? And that really boils down to either poor regression rates of the solid fuels or poor structural stability of the solid fuel in flight conditions. Uh, they have simply never been good enough in terms of performance because of that. And this is what we have resolved with a proprietary solid fuel composition that we call the HRF1 or, or its metallicized version of HRF1 AL, which has been previously tested in flight conditions. It offers dramatically reduced, uh, I mean, dramatically increased density compared to any other combination, liquid or solid. And at the same time, uh, we actually have a better density ISP even compared to Hydrolux at a fraction of the cost. So this is pretty cool. Uh, as you can see on the right, uh, we have done a low altitude demonstration before. We have not observed any structural issues with the solid fuel, which is one of the big problems afflicting most hybrids these days. That opens up uh, our possibility in entering a very interesting uh, you know, dual use kind of, kind of uh, you know, business right here. Um, and by 2031, the propulsion market itself is slated to grow to around $10 billion a year and will become a backbone of the trillion dollar space economy. Uh, aside from new entrants that we can support, we can augment existing launch vehicles with uh, low cost, low risk boosters. That's something you cannot do with us if you implement solid rocket boosters. Instead, you do introduce additional risk on site. And at the same time, we can also uh, work on things like space propulsion. And there's a couple of interesting defense applications as well, like high speed torpedoes and hypersonic boosts and target practice vehicles as well. 30 second warning. That explains why both sides, commercial and uh, government, have already been paying attention. Aside from graduating from the recent Techstars cohort in LA, we are also a part to the AFRL and Space Force Back Accelerator in New Mexico called Fustation. And we also have considerable funding on the way from our national space office here in Singapore. Here's the reason why we are here today. We are sitting on very capable and interesting technology, but to create new products that may be marketable to the U in the US, especially to government clients, we want to build up relationships with large players that can incorporate our tech into new packages. So thank you very much for your kind attention and I am looking forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. Perfect. Uh, feel free to, to start raising your hand. In the uh, and we'll we'll we'll, answer, we'll have the questions get answered in the order uh, in which you start raising them. Yep. Don't be shy. Perfect, Joe. Go right ahead. <laughs> um, I was waiting to see if someone else would ask a question, but yeah, have you pursued um, specifically with MDA Sibbers? Um, I see a, a a very big opportunity there. Yeah, so unfortunately, we are not eligible for SIBRs ourselves because we are right. not a U.S. majority-owned company, which is a bit of a that's, headache. That's a, that's what I see the problem. Okay, um, but certainly, um, I think with your Lockheed Martin people on the team, I think there's a there's obviously a, a opportunities there with that for many things. Yeah, you know, to add a, a little comment here. Uh, you know, one of our fellow hybrid propulsion companies, Firehawk, was recently invested in by, I believe, Raytheon. So clearly there is a, there is an upswell in interest in what can be done with hybrids in, in the defense space. Sure. Perfect. Martina, go right ahead. Um, yes. Um, how many tests have you um, done so far and in which scale have you actually operated? Yeah, so the biggest motor we have fired so far was, uh, if I remember correctly, eight inches in diameter, uh, 
couple of kilonewtons of thrust, we are actually moving towards a 24 kilonewton thrust uh, level test in the next two weeks. Uh, in terms of altitudes that we got to, uh, we could, because of the side limitations that we had available during the whole COVID situation, you know, it was, travel was really challenging at that point in the region. Uh, so we could only go to around 4,000 feet, but uh, we have recently secured funding to uh, for a sounding rocket program that's going to exceed, car, you know, cross Karman line in the next, you know, I hope 18 months. So uh, t on the TRL level, we consider ourselves at, at, at five right now, since we did demonstrate, you know, this technology in flight conditions, but we have not really went to, to near space or space environment with it just yet. I would love to have more information and reach out to me, please. All right, fantastic. Awesome, Bob, you're up, last question. Just curious about the composition of your, of your tanks. Um, what are they made of? It looks like it's a high reinforced carbon fiber tanks and that's yeah. it. Yeah, so for our combustion yeah. chambers and oxidizer tanks, we use composites. Uh, you know, typically they're filament wound. You know, we, we have explored use of some 3D printing technologies, but we just found filament winding to be drastically more cost of and time effective in comparison. So, um, uh, yeah, carbon fiber is one of the materials that we can use, and uh, you know, basically, you know, our our tank pressures are basically in the in the, in the, in the ballpark of sixty to seventy bar right now. So we actually have quite a bit of uh, of wiggle room in in terms of what we use for it. Okay, interesting. Let's talk offline. Thank you. Uh, sure, would love to. Perfect. Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, fantastic presentation. Feel free to leave your contact information in the in the chat once once you're done here. And yeah, I think there were a few even I thought I saw a few questions in the chat. So take a look there as well. Um, sure. Next up, we have in orbit aerospace, and presenting for in orbit will be Ryan. Um, Ryan, the screen and floor is yours when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Okay, can you see the presentation here? Yeah, not in there, it is presentation mode, everything's set. Excellent, awesome. Great. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, as you said, my name is Ryan Elliott. I'm the CEO and a co founder here at In Orbit Aerospace. Gravity has a huge effect on a variety of physical processes, such as how our bodies work and how materials form. And when we remove gravity, such as in space, we can create materials that are a hundred times better than those we can make on the ground. And we can even create completely new materials. And this isn't sci-fi. We've known this for over 50 years, but today there is still just one platform where you can perform research and manufacturing in space and only one vehicle that can bring products back to the ground. And that's a huge problem because customers have faced months of wait times to get up there. And to get up there is over $100,000 a kilogram of cost to them. We're gonna fix this problem by providing an uncrewed service to space and back. We're gonna build two vehicles, an orbital platform we call the Haven Shepherd that hosts customer built manufacturing labs in space, providing them with the power and data they need to operate. We'll also be building a re-entry capsule that is reusable called the Haven Retriever. And this will bring the raw materials up to the Haven Shepherd, exchanging them with the finished products and bring them, bringing them back down to earth. We can fly a constellation of these platforms in space, catering to different industry verticals and fly a fleet of retrievers for year round operations. This is different from the rest of the competitive landscape that is solely facing one or building one single piece, just the re-entry capsule or a platform. We provide this cohesive and comprehensive end-to-end -end service. By leaving the labs in space, our customers only need to pay for the products that matter to them and make their business model close. And we put capabilities such as re-entry, rendezvous proximity operations and docking together, along with robotic manipulation. There are a dozen use cases that are also applicable to the defense community, such as satellite capture, debris removal, satellite recovery and cargo delivery all over the world in under an hour. The products that people are looking to make in space are of particular interest. And these range from pharmaceuticals where companies are actively developing cures for blindness and cancer in space or building semiconductors for cleaner energy for electric vehicles and photovoltaics. 
there's a hundreds of thousands of optical fibers that need to be replaced. And we can make fibers in space that transfer a hundred times as much data. There's also billions of dollars worth of research and tech demonstrations to be done if we ever actually want to become a spacefaring society. Uh, the business model for ours is simple. We charge a premium per kilogram for the whole end-to-end -end service. We take care of working with the launch providers, the FAA, the FCC, the regulatory bodies, and we plan our first launch for the end of 2024. Uh, by the end of the decade, we will be launching every single week, bringing tens of thousands of kilograms back from orbit. And this business model and our technology has rung strong with the community. We have over $180 million worth of letters of intent, not just from customers who want to manufacture products in space, but also customers who want to just develop technologies and test their space hardware and even service their crude commercial space stations. We also are directly working with NASA on a Space Act agreement to develop our uh, thermal protection system and received an MOU from the Air Force Research Lab to use the reentry vehicle as a hypersonic test bed for a selectable phase, direct to phase two SIBR. Uh, I started this company with Yushan Patel and Antonio Coelho. I met Antonio in grad school. I've known him for over seven years. Uh, he's known into Yushan since high school. Uh, we all have the experience combined from the full end-to-end -end systems lifecycle, from systems engineering, design, manufacturing, and operations. Uh, together with our team that is six as of this week, we have collectively flown over 15 satellites and worked on as many missions themselves, uh, from CubeSats to military communication satellites, and even the James Webb Telescope. Our process is design and fly iteratively. And we've made great progress over the last year, building scale models, performing the simulations, performing flight tests, and iterating on that process. Uh, and we are actively working on the full-scale prototype now, which we plan on flying later this year on a suborbital test flight. We are also uh, proud to consider ourselves a uh, tech donors backed company uh, being picked out of 600 companies to serve in the most recent cohort, being validated by the Space Force, JPL, and NASA. Uh, so I thank you for having me today. Uh, you know, main, one of the main reasons we're here is well, two part. We are always, you know, we're raising right now and then raising a seed fund. Uh, we are also always looking for connections within the DOD for end users, potential customers. Uh, to discuss what requirements they may have, and also industry connections, because there are so many applications here that the industry does not know about. We need to spread the word about this potential here. Uh, and also, of course, great recruits and talent as we continue to grow our team. And together, we can all bring the wonders of space to Earth from in orbit. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That was fantastic. All right. So um, if just so the attendees know, if you have a question, uh, feel free to use the Q&A. Um, if you're an attendee, if you're a panelist, feel free to obviously raise your hand and we will answer them in the order in which you ask. Uh, and with that, James, go right ahead. Great. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, appreciate what you shared. Um, I work with a group that actually funds space research. My name is James Fury. I work with a group called the Translational Research Institute for Space Health. Um, we fund research across multiple plat platforms and, and carriers um, and then aggregate that information for use uh, on researchers on Earth. I'm interested in the G-forces that you expect on the return um, vehicles. Um, if you are going to be targeting things like pharma, if you're going to be looking at things like protein folding and some of the things that may result in therapeutics on Earth, um, you know, can you guarantee that those things will come down intact with some kind of minimal G load or something to that effect? Uh, yeah, you know, with specific lifting profiles and, and you know, offset centers of mass of, of the reentry vehicles, you can uh, still achieve quite a lot. So we would be looking for something similar to a space shuttle profile, which was acceptable for those. You know, we've ran these by uh, the current kind of field and customers of what uh, we've spoken to so far, uh, and, and it works for them. Uh, but if there are any other particular things about that, you know, I'd love to follow up and have a call. I heard you know, what you did and very interested in following up with the discussion. Absolutely. Let's let's talk off on. Cool. Perfect. Martina, go right ahead. 
Um, hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for your presentation. So I, I kind of have a couple of questions. Um, I'm interested in mobility uh, within your uh, build. Um, if I were to fly a 3D printing solution and I wanted to 3D print, is there a possible solution for that to be implemented is my first question. Like, how would you tackle research that might need to be moved or might need to be mobile? Do, do you have that configured already? Uh, so, you know, the answer is yes. You know, there, there's companies out there that are, you know, in the same space that are looking at building materials. We are, we are really the infrastructure to allow you to do that. So at the end of the day, we provide power, we provide data, uh, we provide re-entry capabilities. We are the utility company uh, in space. Uh, and, and, you know, 3D printers are, are something that we've talked with, with a number of people about, um, and they are something that we can host, you know, when it, comes to everything, every manufacturing lab is most likely going to have to have something that moves uh, and minimizing the vibrations for a microgravity environment. If we have multiple customers on board is something that we need to keep in mind, uh, but there are loads of, uh, you know, vibration dampening and mitigation techniques that we could do. Uh, so you know, 3D printing is an amazing application. I've been a fan of that owner of fan in space, you know, since I you know, was in uh, high school. Uh, so Let's talk about that too further. If there's one thing I like more than building this, it's, it's, it's talking about it. I have a colleague, her name is Bianca, and she is the producer of Space Dots, which are tiny labs in orbit. I think it's going to be great if you can utilize her somehow. Thank you so much for your answer. Of course, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Last but not least is uh, Tim Denning. Go right ahead. Sure, I just wonder what intellectual property do you possess? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Tim. Um, uh, you know, I can definitely give you more specifics about that later, but a big part of what we need to replace to make this an uncrewed system is, is what the astronauts do. Uh, and they do, you know, some very particular actions on board the ISS to, to interact with the experiments and the manufacturing labs up there. Uh, we need to make that autonomous and we need to make that robotic. Uh, and we do have ideas. So uh, if you're interested in following up, definitely. Definitely some good stuff to talk about. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, as I said before, I'm sorry to be a broken record, but feel free to leave any contact information you want left in the chat. Um, and also we'll, we'll tr make sure to try to connect you to the right people um, afterwards. Uh, awesome. So yeah, perfect. Uh, next up, we have Space Gold Corporation and presenting for Space Gold is Jasper. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. All right. Do you see my screen? Uh, yeah, it's not on presentation mode yet. How about now? It is now, yep. OK. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jasper Julian, CEO of Space Gold Corporation. Uh, we started back in 2019. Uh, we are key managers, directors at large enterprises like Boeing, Pratt & Whitney, Qualcomm. And we're passionate to offer a mining approach, which, is, which sustains life on the planet and space. Uh, today, we develop a commercially viable technology to mine and refine metals in space. Uh, we're using uh, the physics of space, like vacuum, like higher intensity of solar energy. And just recently, newly founded companies are following our technology, which puts us in a leadership position and doubles our motivation to go out there and bring home the funding we require for the manufacturing process. Uh, what mining is doing, the damage it's uh, uh, doing to our planet is not a secret to anyone, but uh, probably most of us don't know the scale of it. So. I have a few examples here for you to read through and maybe after the session, I wish I had two hours to go through many, many of them, but uh, just as, as an example, a wedding ring that uh, many, many of us uh, may purchase during our lifetime, uh, just to produce that single wedding ring, wedding ring uh, mining industry produced 20 tons of waste. Which means just, uh, it's like, imagine you have 20 F-150 truck in front of your house, fully loaded, fully loaded uh, with waste. That's how much waste we are producing to make that one single wedding ring. But what is the solution? If we just look up there uh, in space, there are higher grades of metals 
And believe it or not, it's uh, more uh, cost effective to do mining through this uh, technology, mining in space than mining on the planet. Plus you're saving tons of those uh, damages to our planet. Uh, but why choosing us? I'm just coding a few lines, uh, feedback from NASA engineers uh, on our uh, project through NASA SPIR. It greatly simplifies lunar mining. Uh, it has exceptional creativity and it's all in one process, which means it's lightweight. Uh, you don't have multiple operations, so it's faster. Uh, it's a smaller spacecraft. And also uh, they mentioned that it follows logical steps in development, no surprises. Uh, we've been in uh, industry for a few years as the engineers, directors, uh, we know how to develop a deep, deep tech uh, product. Uh, but we're proud that we took advantage of technical advice from uh, Dante Larita. Uh, he is principal investigator of OSIRIS-REx mission, the biggest asteroid mission ever so far. Uh, and we are doing our lab test at uh, Interplanetary Initiatives Lab, uh, directed by Lindy Elkins, principal investigator of the next biggest asteroid mission called Psyche. Uh, as I mentioned, also, uh, there are newly founded companies that are following our technology, uh, which uh, that actually creates our potential uh, future customers and we can uh, do licensing as a side business, uh, as a side revenue for what we're doing. Uh, but for now, uh, we're looking for $15 million for uh, seed stage, which uh, builds up our post money valuation uh, to 150 million. We're offering 10% equity. Uh, that is mostly going to uh, our orbital test, which is going to be the first uh, ever uh, metal mining in space. Uh, overall, we made it 180 million. Uh, it's a relatively large investment, but a huge gain is to start uh, the space mining uh, sector in the industry. Uh, I have our team members, the key team members listed here. If you want to go through our background, uh, you can take a look at this slide. Uh, mostly we're uh, working uh, in aerospace tech companies. Uh, we are senior engineers, directors, managers, uh, and that's it. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, you can always uh, reach us through these emails with more questions, uh, but I'm now open to any questions. Eric, thank you. Thank you so much, Jasper. Uh, Joe, go right ahead. Hi, Jasper. Um, Hi. I had just a, you just quickly mentioned your um, $15 million for your orbital. I didn't quite capture everything you were saying. What is what is that test going to involve? Is that going to just um, circle around something? Is it going to land on something? Um, you know, is your how mature is your RPO system? Okay, uh, we are currently at TRL uh, three, so we have the simulation, uh, all the soft uh, design uh, in place. Uh, we are starting our lab tests uh, pretty soon. Uh, so that orbital test is our prototype. It's a smaller scale, but it's the first time. It, it's gonna be in the orbit. Uh, not landing on anything, uh, but it's going to be the first metal processing uh, in space. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. If there's no other questions, thank you so mm -hmm. much, Jasper. Other questions? Of course. And uh, what, what, what you can do is you can, again, yeah, throw up your information. If you want to, yeah, if anyone wants to connect with Jasper, feel free. Um, and, and thank you so much for sharing. That was, that was nice. Um, next up, we're going to have Richard from the Hyperspace Propulsion. Sorry, I added a dot. From Hyperspace Propulsion. Go right ahead, Richard. Share your screen when you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Richard Lug. I am the CEO and founder of Hyperspace Propulsion. We are a space transportation company bringing to bear the first uh, hybrid space plane for travel around the world, anywhere in the world, runway to runway, uh, payloading uh, up to 200 passengers or 100 tons of cargo. 
I am uh, a manager and executive from the space industry uh, over more than 30 years and saw a lot of uh, things in the areas of propulsion and rockets and uh, served on many programs as PM and C-suite uh, positions. And I was always asking, there must be a better way to space. Space Star is our answer for providing uh, rapid and regular and robust flight to space, uh, runway to runway as a, in a space plane configuration. One of the missions we've been examining for the commercial transport market is New York to Singapore, uh, where we can travel. It's normally an 18 hour and uh, 18 hour, 14, 40 minute flight. And we're conduct we'll be conducting that in 78 minutes. We, uh, the enabling technology for our company's uh, Space Star vehicle is uh, the high scram engine. So the high scram engine is a hybrid uh, air breathing rocket propulsion system, which is basically a turbine based rocket based combined cycle engine. And we produce large amounts of electric power in our superconducting core. And that electricity is used to match and bring the different engine, engine cycles together electrically. So we have a seamless operation from runway to space, uh, to the outer atmosphere, into space, past the common line, and have access as far as the International Space Station. To uh, build out this very complex and fairly long program, we have several development phases for uh, starting with our flight demonstrator, HyperSmart, in 2025. This vehicle has been proven out in its baseline design and configuration on a U.S. Navy Naval Research Laboratories program, which ran two years from 2019 to 2021, which we just finished. And now we're moving forward to a phase two um, with Office of Naval Research. This, uh, this phase two will get us through the engine build and ground test and then towards first flight. In 2026, we have overlap and we're building high scram full-scale engine, which will then be de demonstrated on our flight vehicle, High Ram, which is a full-scale, basically a flight interceptor in 2028. These technologies and these demonstrators will build onto a full-scale prototype and demonstration of Space Star as a single vehicle. The HyperSmart program is based on, that is an aero wave rider vehicle that is used to demonstrate by us to fly in the atmosphere up to Mach 15 at a range of 1,500 nautical miles up to 135,000 feet. The engine cycle system is the most critical for us reducing the risk and managing the program going forward into the more complex but more efficient uh, full-scale high scrum engine. There are three core technology we'll be demonstrating in flight. Uh, the first one is a morphing inlet, which manages the airflow and sustains combustion throughout the flight envelope on, this, on these flight tests. We'll be building two vehicles. Second core technology is the plasma fuel injection uh, technology. And we've been, all of us, in, anywhere in the, in the scramjet air breathing propulsion side and access space have been challenged by that notion of keeping a match than the hurricane. So our, our butterfly strut jet technology, which we've been pretty far advanced on that for combustion and sustaining high-speed flight across the flight envelope is another part of our, our demonstration on hypersmart in flight. And lastly, we have our electromagnetic drag reduction technology. This technology we've been working on for five or six years uh, in the laboratories, we've proven it. It's 96% effective. We removed the drag and the, and the boom and the Mach number bow shock on the vehicle uh, across the flight envelope, and it's going to be proven to be very effective. We've identified several strategic partners uh, going forward, um, and that is the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. Uh, we've had the presence and opportunity to work with the United States Air Force, but specifically Space Missile Command uh, on a mission, which the HyperSmart vehicle was started on and then folds into high ramp. And then lastly, NASA, we've spent time with NASA on planning to go forward in 2023 for a space act agreement for the full build out of high scram and all, also the space star in 2028 to through 2030. Our anticipated customers are the US Air Force and Navy, uh, NASA, and then on the commercial side, uh, companies such as Emirates Airlines and United Airlines who we've uh, presented to and in discussion with, and then the, some of the newcomers, but certainly uh, mature and currently flying like Virgin Galactic. From a business standpoint and strategy, we see that airlines will become future space lines. And so they will be flying Space Star. Our core team is in leadership and management by myself. Uh, one of our key, our key people are Vincent Rausch, who was the government uh, director and chief officer on the, the NASP, National Aerospace Plane Program, which ran from 1984 through 1996. And then also a, a gentleman, George Abbey, uh, and his father, who are known and done a lot of work in building out the Apollo space program. And George joins us uh, heading up our business development international contracts. The other folks uh, with us are leader, provide leadership in technology management and engineering. 
30 second warning. On our fundraise, we are presently finishing our seed round of 1 million and we're out opening up and the ask is for a $10 million A series round, which we'll utilize to build out the ground test and the HyperSmart engine. And then we follow on that with a B round at 45 million that will bring us through first flight and brings us to the completion of the design engine, you know, the full scale high, uh, high scram engine for the Space Star program. We absolutely believe, we have the conviction that uh, Space Star is the future of space travel. Flying runway to runway through space for long distances as well as space access, we're removing that bottleneck and the inefficiencies of pure rockets as we are using a combination of an air breathing and a combined cycle engine to get there. So the key is, the, is in the propulsion system for us and performing with Space Star. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks for your time. Absolutely, thank you so much, Richard. All right, feel free to queue up uh, and we'll, we'll go through them as they come. All right, Martina, go right ahead. I guess I'll go. Um, how far are you with R&D so far? Which um, stages are you tackling right now? Uh, on our HyperSmart program, we're at a stage of like a TRL three to four. Um, we're this next year, we have a series of contract manufacturing partners to start 3D printing the scramjet engine. Uh, the injection combustion technology is fairly mature. We're gonna be building that in-house. And um, the flight vehicle itself, where the engine integrates into, we're at about somewhere between a two and a three, and we start uh, wind tunnel testing next year. We're looking at a couple of research or universities as one platform, and then we have ties to NASA Langley for a larger wind tunnel test, and that will take us into first flight. If, if I can assume, um, the 3D printing might be relativity space, and the wind tunnel will be at Ames, if I'm correct, if you can disclose. Yeah, um, we started working on the program with Ames. Um, as far as the mock numbers where we need to perform, uh, we'll be at um, NASA Glenn and NASA Langley for the higher mock numbers. And we are, you know, scaling the program starting small. And we uh, have ties to Texas A&M on their Mach 9 wind tunnel for our small, but we call it the miniature, the miniature hypersmart. So that's this next year, first quarter. Um, have you considered going internationally? And if so, um, what, I know it's a bit far-fetched, but what would you want to see and what kind of a talent pool can you attract if that can be open? Yeah, we've, uh, we've actually built ties uh, internationally in Europe and the UK, and uh, we're directly uh, tied in currently in front of the UK government for their, they have a hypersonics effort that provides uh, funding there. And also we've had um, recent interest out of Germany and France and we did uh, tour all the wind tunnel test facilities in France a couple of years ago. So we've had considerable interest, which surprised us. And we see a program of this magnitude that an international effort with the United States leading as being really exciting that can be done. Um, thanks, Richard. I'm both at Glenn and at Ames presence. So I would love to, you know, see what, what you guys are doing there. That'd be great. Appreciate it. Sure. And I think Mike Moran in the chat asked, how does this compare to the new Warp Drive 3? Uh, not sure how familiar you are with that. I see, what, what is the question? How does this compare to the new Warp Drive 3? Well, our propulsion system is a combined cycle engine, essentially. So we're, remove, we're removing the inefficiencies of flying through the, the atmosphere for the first third. And because we're ground launched from runways, I think what is really different is that, you know, we're opening up that, um, that envelope to access space, which right now when you're flying a pure rocket, you know, vertically, you're on a, a really tight launch window. And two, because it's a hybrid and the electrical systems are tied, we really bring the efficiencies of flying to space. And because we're a winged vehicle and how we're designed as an integrated system, our payload capacity is significant. Perfect. Perfect. And then someone else in the chat asked if you have a European company. Uh... <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. Uh, feel free to leave any contact information you'd like to. Um, thank you again so much for joining. Uh, last, thank you. Thank you. Last presentation of the day, we have Target Arm, and presenting for Target Arm will be Jeff. Jeff, the floor and the screen are yours when you are ready. Okay.
I'm loading it right now. Hang on, just uh, bringing it up. All good. Take your time. Uh, I don't think that actually worked properly. Hang on. If you want, we could also share on our end, potentially. No, that should be good. Can you okay. see it all right? I see it. It's not presentation mode quite yet. There it goes. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Jeff McChesney. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Target Arm. And uh, I'm a former F-15 combat fighter pilot and commander, uh, fighter weapons school graduate, uh, aeronautical engineer, and uh, all kinds of other things that are associated with that, so, as well as uh, uh, graduates of uh, a couple of different accelerator programs as shown here, as well as uh, a resident both at Mass Robotics and at uh, New Lab in New York, Mass Robotics being in Boston. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about active debris removal and autonomous non-cooperative target capture, both of those using the exact same device that we developed for package delivery. And you go like, uh, okay, this is a space meeting. What are we talking about package delivery? For, <clears throat> well, getting packages to space is part of the deal, but that's not what I'm going to be actually uh, focusing in on, is the device that we've created that uh, works on the ground and works with UAVs on the ground and drones on the ground is completely transferable into space and actually uh, somewhat easier to actually do what we want to get done. Uh, obviously, the environment in space is a little bit different, but the actual execution I'm going to show you in just a little bit. So we've evolved from a packed delivery solution uh, into military uh, solutions, and now we're moving into the space solutions as well, using the exact same device and be able to scale it back and forth. Uh, the, the key to this is we're currently at TRL-7, and we're testing many of the technologies here on the ground uh, to de-risk it to take it up into space. And if I can get this to go forward. Uh, so our device is called TULAR and it enables the launch recovery and on the ground here for both rotary and fixed wing drones from any moving vehicle. And we can do that autonomously. We've already been at uh, speeds of 65 miles per hour and we have a contract with the Air Force to take it onto the C-17 aircraft to launch and recover unmanned combat air vehicles airborne up to 145 knots at 8,000 feet. Uh, and it, uh, when I designed this and invented this myself, I always thought that space was a viable opportunity. And now we're starting to, to go after that as well. I'm going to show you a video right now. Let me make sure. Can you see that video? I want to make sure that you're seeing my full screen. We can see it. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, this is this is our Tular device that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you it on the ground so you can see the operation. So this thing actually works. Uh, this isn't a concept. Again, we're at TRL7. We're executing it on a daily. We just built this device. Finished it last week for an automobile manufacturer to put into an SUV. Uh, and you're going again, how does this apply? And I'm gonna tie those, uh, those pieces together for you. So let me show the video here. Okay, that device that I'm showing you right now, again, uh, just built, it includes all of our latest technologies. That is completely autonomous. There's no human interaction at all incorporated with that. We have uh, multiple sensors uh, that are operating on the drone and multiple sensors that are operating inside our device, which is Tular. We're not the drone company. We're the device that does the capture, launch and, recap and, and uh, recovery. That's a key component to where we're going when I start talking about my overall vision, which I'm gonna show right now, which is that everything get be connected over time if you can actually physically move things while you're moving versus all being static. And if you notice up here, I'm starting to show space as a capability that we'd have as well. Now, the key problem that's in space and getting to the problem set is, is that uh, debris removal is a very, very complex problem with hundreds of thousands of uh, pieces that we've got to try and uh, remove uh, from, uh, you know, from, to actually improve the safety of flight. And how do you do that on a high uh, cycle rate and high repetitive rate, and how do you do it from refueling? Some of the refueling problems are being solved. One of our one of our partners that we're working with is OrbitFat. You guys are probably familiar with it for a gas station in space. Uh, if you have a gas station in space, can you go pick up debris and deorbit it, uh, or can you do non-cooperative target capture, which uh, is obviously go take something that the other people may not want you to be having? So the way that you think about this is take a spacecraft. You take our Tular device instead of having it 
backwards facing, you turn around and it's forward facing. And now that the control mechanisms that we're currently having with the robotics capability that we've built about tracking where that target is and when to capture that target now looks forward non-cooperatively at a piece of debris and says, move that spaceship when you're in plane to get to that uh, target and not have to stop. We plan on being between one and three meters per second. So the Delta V that we're gonna be able to accumulate over time with hundreds of thousands of pieces of debris is quite substantial because we can just get the plane, go by, pick up the debris, go by, pick up another piece of debris, on down the line to pick up debris, refuel, deorbit, and go get more. Or if it's non-cooperative, pick up the device and bring it back to either onboard a, a space station or uh, back to Earth, if that happens to be your example here. But our two-layer device is scalable. We can make it bigger or smaller. We're currently targeting five centimeter to, to uh, 100 centimeter targets uh, and uh, in low Earth orbit. So it's non-cooperative target capture, active debris. Uh, we are currently working on our automotive uh, point, uh, our uh, 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 POC, uh, and we're working on a C-17. Both of those are under contract right now. Uh, the key to this is, is that our autonomous capability, hands-free, no operator requirement to do this, is, is that our pins, as you saw in the, in the device that I just showed you, does the ener energy absorption for the delta V as well as any rotational momentum uh, that's, a, that's occurring as well. Both of those are occurring with, uh, we're estimating less than 0.1 degree to a larger uh, mass spaceship. Uh, and that reduces your thruster fuel required per uh, kilogram of pickup that you need to be doing. Uh, we're working on a subscale prototype right now to take into a phase two uh, that we're uh, working with Space Force. We're currently on a phase one with Space Force for Orbital Prime to do what, exactly what I'm talking about doing. We're dual use. These are just some of the use cases on the ground uh, that we're working on. So we're able to piggyback on the technology and the sensor fusion that we have on the ground to take it into space. These are all actively in the work today. There's no competing technology to do the kinds of capabilities that we have on the ground. We don't believe there's anything in the air uh, or space that can do exactly what we're doing. No netting, no grappling hooks, uh, able to go by essentially like a Pac-Man and keep moving forward. We've got barriers to entry with uh, patents in the air, ground, and uh, sorry, air, water, and space, uh, and that we are actually drone agnostic and a robotics company. Uh, we are a robotics company at our core. Uh, all of these people that you sh are shown right here are all roboticists. We don't have space as our uh, main category yet. We'll build that capability. We're currently teamed on two uh, SBIRs and STTRs with the Air Force. Uh, and uh, in those cases, we're working with MIT Lincoln Laboratory to bring our space technology to us. Like I said, uh, we've had uh, multiple SBIRs and STTRs. We've had four phase ones and three phase twos. We've teamed with uh, BAE Systems. And we'll announce in the next two weeks uh, the automobile company that we are doing a proof of concept with. We've actually built the device and uh, it's in shipment right now uh, to them uh, to do the demonstration that we had planned on. And we'll do the, the uh, public release after that. So we're trying to move this into space. We think we could do it relatively fast. We're in contact with the International Space Station National Laboratory. Uh, they're asking us to submit a uh, proposal to them next week. Uh, and our plan is, is to uh, modify what we have, get it up internal to the International Space Station, uh, and then tar start working on the external side. And we've teamed up uh, as an implementation partner with NanoRacks, as many of you are probably familiar with. We're asking for an investment capability. Uh, we're currently taking investment. We're also looking for uh, support to, with Space Force. So anybody with Space Force that wants to talk to us, we're willing to talk to. And like I said, we're working with the International Space Station to uh, start uh, building the capability. And we're really gonna be adapting what we have to a space environment that already works on the ground. There's gonna be no turbulence in space with a vacuum. So I'm open uh, to questions and answers that you, uh, or questions that you have, and hopefully I've got some answers for you. Uh, but uh, we're emerging fast into the space arena and uh, we look forward to having some support to do that. Obviously, uh, money is going to be a key factor to get to space versus the things that we're currently doing uh, with the venture capital we've raised to date. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jeff. Martina, you're first up, followed by Nat. Jeffrey, congratulations. This is an um, interesting concept. And since you're a robotics company, I see one really interesting way forward for, for your potential. Uh, and that would be potentially capturing somehow QSS uh, because of debris and the orbiting issues. Uh, have you considered that? Do you have any plans forward within that field? 
Uh, you, you got cut out. Uh, the one word that uh, was cut out was the word uh, of what the uh, industry you're talking about. Um, yeah, um, debris capture or deorbiting is something that you've considered or something that you can, are you able to actually produce something with it? Have you considered capturing debris and deorbiting it back through your systems? Yeah, yeah, Lowering yes, uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So we're working uh, to get on the space station to just show that we can actually capture uh, a, a Delta V capability by just going by it. So we're, we're designing that right now to pick up that uh, piece of debris. The beauty of our system is it brings it back inside. So you can actually get one and then get another, get another, get another, get another. I designed it as a gun, but unlike a gun that only shoots, it also recovers the bullet. Uh, so the debris is just another bullet that we're going out after. So we're not going to be the spacecraft that does the deorbiting and uh, and the uh, the velocity back towards the Earth, but we'll be the capture capability. Just so if capture. you put it on, yeah. yeah, if you put it on another spacecraft and say we have an area where you can put in 50 kilograms or 500 kilograms of debris, you bring that inboard, you deorbit it uh, with a velocity back towards the Earth, and then you hit an orbit fab again for refueling. And go get another 500 kilograms. So that's our idea here: is, is that we'll go, we'll be going, we'll stay in space on a space vehicle, recovering on every plane that you want to be operating on to get as many pieces of debris as you can. Now we're not going after the, you know, the Hubble spacecraft uh, or the Hubble telescope uh, size spacecraft. We're after currently looking at the five centimeters to about 100 centimeters because we don't want to make it too big and too heavy for these initial tests. That was my next question um, to follow up on that. What is your scalability capabilities as of now? How big can you actually make this happen? So, so we're, we currently have one built for the Air Force for convoy protection. It's currently at five feet wide, four feet deep and four feet high for capture volume. So that's 80 cubic feet for a capture volume capability that we have. We have the one that I just showed you for the automobile company, that's eight cubic feet, two by two by two. Uh, the one that we're going to build for the International Space Station is gonna, probably going to be one foot by one foot by one foot. But all we do is add numbers of pins. We've already built the computer mechanisms for managing the pins. We've already built the sensors for finding the targets and deciding when to close and actually grapple those pins. So the pins close and create a clamping force and bring it back inside. So the technology around us being able to do the actual acquisition is, is already built and being operated at a scale of five feet wide, and for the C-17 we're building for the Air Force is 16 feet wide. So that's already in design as well. We're already doing computational fluid dynamics around the C-17 with the very, very positive results. Um, do you use any AI in this? Uh, we have not, we have not yet. Our, our pipeline does have that included. So we're going into MPC, which is a flight control capability, uh, which is predictive flight controls. Uh, we're building that in, and then we're going to add an MPC and AI capability simultaneous. Uh, so that's, those are coming in our uh, technology pipeline. Thank you, Jeffrey. That was incredible. Thank you so much for the insight. Oh, cool. Matt, you, you're a... Yeah, I, I think you may have answered uh, answered it for the most part. I was kind of curious about your business model because uh, for some of the, uh, you know, on ground kind of, or even in the air, uh, it seems like uh, your form factor has to be highly tailored for the particular application. So there's not like a, a necessarily a commoditization here, uh, but for space, uh, it's, it's or is there? Are you trying to eventually? Yeah, yeah no. The, the the thing about uh, when I when I when I invented this opportunity was is it is scalable. So it's really it's really the vehicle that you want to carry it on is going to determine the size and maybe the, the what you're going to go after. So. Again, for the Air Force for convoy protection, we designed it to handle Raven, which is a, a four and a half foot fixed wing capability. Uh, but if they want to put it on the C-17, we've got up to 16 feet. You can take it down to one foot. So it's really going to be the vehicle that you want to carry it on and what you want to actually do with it will actually determine the size. For us to build it, we add, we add pins in uh, the X and Y axes and we're good to go. Uh, these pins deploy, we can control them, we can put them at distance, we can accelerate them, we can slow them down. Uh, they're fully controllable. Each one is individually uh, motored uh, with, uh, with stepper motors today. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and I mean, in the space domain, uh, I was curious about your business model. It sounds like you're, you, have, you, have, you keep the same business model because it, it does sound like you could, you know, launch your own sets and uh, and have this. We, 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 we could, but, uh, you know, uh, this is this is my sixth startup, guys and gals, uh, 
I don't want to be good at everything. I want to be good at the things that we're really, really good at. And right now it is the robotics, the control mechanisms, and, and the pin design that we built into our tool, our capability. People know how to build spaceships better than I can. People know how to compute uh, or orbits, and people probably know how to deorbit this better than I'm ever going to have the capability to do. That's Could we right. learn to do it? Yes, but that's not what we we need to add a, a robust capability from the ground, adapt it to the spaceborne operation, and give us a solution for active debris removal that doesn't exist today. And I, I'll I'll bet that the people that are talking on on this uh, session as well as others can figure out how to get us to space and get us back uh, and get us to the debris for that matter. Uh, but the actual targeting and to be able to not have to stop and solve all the uh, mathematical problems for the energy and just go right on by is something very, very novel. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. Cool. Joe, you're up. Uh, really interesting concept. You're hitting a lot of the notes, especially of the players that you're working with. Uh, Jeff, and so a um, couple of things. Has any has any piece of hardware been thought of uh, thinking ahead to be space qualified? And I'm just worried about some of those headaches coming up up to you. You said you had you're starting to hire space people. Yeah. Have you have you yeah, worked so, through some so, of that? Yeah. So so again, we've uh, I'm an aeronautical guy, right? So I'm thinking air, airplanes in the in the air uh, capability here. And from Lockheed, you fully understand that. So. So uh, everything is designed right now that we're adapting from the ground operation package delivery to get it airborne, which is a separate set of environmental conditions. You know, it's got to handle 2Gs. It's got to handle environmental temperature changes. Space is another category, much higher than that. That's where MIT Lincoln Laboratory, unit number uh, 74 and 75, are doing airborne and space uh, simultaneously. They're bringing in our space considerations of the materials we currently are building with. So we build everything currently with the extremely fast rapid prototyping. We do it all in-house right now. Uh, I shouldn't say all in-house. I mean, we do the large machining out of house, but uh, we actually uh, assemble everything currently uh, inside because we're building low lot rate numbers at the current uh, time. We expect uh, that uh, with MIT coming and looking at what our lubricants are, what our plastics are, what our computes uh, is, uh, they're starting to make recommendations on what we need to get first to the International Space Station on the inside. So like, for, for, for example, we can use a Raspberry Pi in, inside the International Space Station to prove that we can actually capture a, you know, a, a piece of debris moving across the, the space station uh, that's rotating or it's a one meter per second. I've got no doubt that that's going to work, but you know I'm highly confident anyways because it's my company. Uh, but once we've proven that, then we've got to take it outside, right? Uh, and NanoRack is prepared to do that to take it outside. At that point, we'll start to adjusting most of our capabilities to, all right, now how do we make it robust enough to handle the extreme environment of being in space? Are we using the right materials? Uh, and we'll start, to, we'll start approaching that. So MIT has actually presented us with the documentation already of uh, what, what kinds of materials we should be using versus the materials we currently are using. We just haven't started building towards it. Right, uh, and just, I'm sure you're well aware that we do have an agreement with NanoRacks to build a, a space station. So, you know, um, this would be an amazing capability. And if you have any idea who's going to fund the enormous problem of space debris, please contact me first so I can know. <laughs> okay, well, we're, we, we hope to be part of that solution. Uh, right. And uh, so we'll see where it goes. Thanks. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Last question of the of this showcase, Andrew, you're up. Hey Jeff, awesome stuff. I had a, I guess, a few questions. Um, first question uh, was pretty much for your target arm: Are the pins conformal? As in, uh, do you have to program in the space that they conform to, or can they adapt to like pretty much any uh, target platform? Yes, they, 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 the latter is the correct thing. They, I designed them to be completely configurable. So we, we can control them one inch, we can put them five inches, we can have them go at uh, one, uh, one foot per second, we can have them go 29 inches and a half a second. So we can control speed and distance individually across the entire array. And that allows us to, to actually decide, do we want to go all the way around and in jail? That's my word, doesn't exist in the world, uh, but in jail the target that you want. Uh, and when you do that, it gets completely locked in because not only does it have a compression force from both sides, but it also has an enjailing uh, capability at the same time. 
Uh, so we can control all of that. We can only close them, you know, halfway. If there's something that is delicate, you don't want to touch, we don't deploy the pins. We do that currently today with the airborne ones. Okay. And then I guess uh, kind of going after the the more of uh, like a damage, potentially not super damage, um, more of a, an offensive capability. Have you potentially looked into adding it to like a mobile platform that could potentially... Uh, latch on to another device. Uh, you got to tell me a little bit more what you mean about an offensive capability. So I I have presented this to Space Force as a non-cooperative target capture. So the ability to capture debris is the same as going to let's just say it's a CubeSat. Can you pick up a CubeSat uh, that you want to go after for some reason? Maybe you want to exploit it. Maybe you want to fix it. Uh, Maybe there may be other reasons that you want to go after something that's non-cooperative or you've lost control of it. You want just want to get it back, right? Uh, so that's one area that we've looked at as well. Uh, are you asking about, do we have an ability to use it in a defensive environment? And that may be a different discussion. Uh, maybe kind of more of a, like a CubeSat, maybe, you know, grasping onto another CubeSat and, it could be offensive, it could be defensive. I guess then yeah, there, this would be a, there, a different the, space that we're going into. Yeah, yeah. there's there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, again, I'm, I'm more military, I, uh, I understand exploitation. Uh, so we designed this conceptually uh, to go after uh, CubeSats if we wanted to. Uh, so the space that I'm talking about, five centimeters to a hundred centimeters is gonna handle most of the smaller uh, satellite uh, opportunities that you're you're thinking of right now. And that's cube, five by 100. Andrew, does that answer your question? I don't, I'm not sure Andrew is hearing us. I think he's frozen. I think he's frozen. Okay. But what I'll do is I'll ask him if he wants to be connected offline, because it does sound sure. like some of the conversation might be better for offline anyway. Um, yeah. 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 And uh, and it, I put in my chat about the 15 minutes ago, I put all my contact information. It's up on the screen as well. If you just do a screenshot, you'll grab it. Uh, and uh, I'd love to talk to anybody about this again. I'm going out raising capital uh, all the time. I mean, that's where we're going anyway. Uh, going to space is obviously a capital intensive versus even uh, doing the airborne piece. And I'm also looking at the widening the circle in Space Force and in NASA and the International Space Station. Uh, I'm not I'm not a spacefaring uh, person myself, but I'm fast becoming one. Nice, awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, pleasure having you present. Um, thank you to everyone. I know I see it in the chat. I'm just going to parrot what everyone else is saying. Thank you to everyone who who joined the showcase, who made it possible, and uh, thank you. Uh, special thank you to Brian Markowitz who helped put a lot of this together. Um, again, this was an absolute pleasure hosting everyone. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to hosting another one of these, and I'm hopefully going to see all of you guys there for the it next does. one. So yeah, so it was. I mean, we we continued down the the space path, but I was also kind of looking at multi uh, domain kind of concepts. Uh, yeah, Andrew, if you want me to, the, the idea is is that uh, for my system, I've designed it to work underwater. I've designed it to work in the air. I've designed it to work in the space and to work between all of those domains. I hope he heard me. I can't tell if he heard me or not uh, after. I, I don't know, but you guys should connect offline. Uh, okay. We'll All, right. It up here. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Our next showcase is Autonomous Systems. Feel free to sign up on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me if you want to talk to any of the companies that presented. Um, have a great rest of your day, everyone, and be in touch. Have a good one.